Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Authentic Podcast with Justin Dulard. And thank you for tuning in to another episode. It's time! All right, everybody. Thank you for tuning back into another episode. We are here on a uh, beautiful day in North Tulsa with Mr. Danny Boy O'Connor. Mister, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the founder and CEO of the Outsiders House Museum. So, uh, Danny, I really appreciate your time and uh, and thank you for coming on, even though you're not feeling the greatest. So. Yeah, no, you know, it's all good, man. I, I, I get random uh, migraines here, there, and uh, we've been planning this for a while. Took a while to get connected with you, but I'm... Uh, I feel right at home because we're sitting here right in the living room of the Outsiders house. I think you're the only second guy to ever broadcast out of here, maybe the third, but it, 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 it's, I very rarely let people do it only for it, you know, it could be, I don't, it's like sacred ground. So I'm glad we got to do it here. It's better than uh, having to go somewhere else to do it. So yeah. Yeah, man. I really, uh, I really appreciate that. No worries. <laughs> um, so I see you've been having a lot of, uh, a lot of the extras come by. And you're having the uh, the movie on the lawn. Um, how's that? How's that been going? For we you? are. You know, it's really cool because so for those who don't know, you, I came I came to Tulsa in 2009 on tour. It was the first time ever coming to Tulsa. I'm in a band called House of Pain. This actually, I came with La Coca Nostra, which is another band, which is the first band with other people put into. It's like it was a super group uh, or whatever. Um, and I realized that my favorite book and movie were filmed here and I went looking for locations. And unlike Los Angeles, where I came from, we don't, a lot of the stuff just didn't survive the 80s. There's just such a turn and burn mentality. The, the, the value of the land is so much so that if a business doesn't survive, we click, quickly tear it down and build something else. So to come to Tulsa in 2009 and, and be able to find the driving from the outsiders, the park from the outsiders and then the house, was uh mind boggling and um at the time it looked like it was going to fall in upon itself it was like in really bad shape and uh, it was for sale for forty two thousand dollars and i thought man forty two thousand dollars is doable i just had to also like kind of step away and say dude you, this, you've never been to oklahoma you've never been to tulsa you're not allowed to buy the coolest you know, outsiders collectible known to man, basically the outsider's house. But for the next five years, I um, I kept thinking about this thing and it also started a hobby that I do this urban exploring. But uh, at about five year mark, I came back and I realized if somebody doesn't do something about it, this thing wasn't gonna make it. And then so I ended up finding the owner and making a deal and then here we are. And originally I didn't know what the plan was. I thought maybe I'd live here uh, this would be my first house in about 20 years. You know, we were talking earlier about the prices of houses now in Tulsa, which have like tripled since I've got here five years ago. Uh, cars, or you can buy an, a, a used car or for the price that they bought it. You know, <laughs> it's just it's super expensive right, right now because of the economy. But when I came here, uh, you know, and I bought the house, I wasn't sure what I was going to do, if I was going to live in it, if I was going to just board it up and try to figure out a way to, you know, do something with it. The house was a complete, it was in complete shambles. And so I finally decided, you know what, this is going to be a museum. We're going to do something really cool with it, but I needed help. And then I had to put out a, you know, a GoFundMe and use social media to raise awareness for it. This all goes back to you asking me about the extras. I didn't know that if, if I, I met the Soch in, in Los Angeles, I used to podcast actually. And so we were able to meet Darren Dalton, who was the tall guy who played, uh, uh, wow, my head is, is all messed up. <laughs> he played, uh, Darren Dalton played Randy the Soch. The last name escapes me right now. Usually I'm good like that. But um, I, if I, I, I didn't know who I was going to meet. And then the first people after the, the second people I, I met after that were, were the 52 card pickup kids, the, the two brothers, the Wagoneer brothers. Um, and I thought maybe that's where it stops. You know, I meet a couple people in the movie. We'll try to, we'll try to raise a few dollars. We'll see if we can, 
you know, I don't know. There was no real plan, but this thing just caught it to, to like pick up steam and snowballed, and it just keeps going and going and going. And you know, now we're at the point where um, volunteers and employees who were around Tulsa and was were mingling with the actors when they were at the hotel and were going to like location to location looking for them in the '80s. They're now coming up with new ideas, so they're the ones who came up with the ideas to do an extra, extra event where they reached out to everybody that they could reach out to, whether it was personal connections or through, you know, uh, social media. And I think they've got like, I don't know, 25, 30 extras that are all coming. So although we've showed the the Outsiders on the Outsiders House lawn before, and it's always a great uh, event and it's always a sold out event to bring the extras here all at one day and get them, you know, do some commentary with them, some before and after Q&A uh, and watch the movie with them is going to be fantastic. I guess just to just, I now sit back and watch them make up, come up with cool ideas, which is also refreshing because it's like, you know, I've been at this now since 2016 and, you know, you sometimes you need to like step back and just let it breathe. But it really rarely get a chance to get a to 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 do that. Um, you know, this week out of the blue, Matt Dillon showed up the first time in 39 years, making it back to you Tulsa, did, Oklahoma. You didn't know he was coming. Uh uh-uh. oh. I mean, I saw somebody in England who's a fan. This this girl Katie, and she posted something about Matt Dillon coming to Oklahoma City, and hopefully he would show up at the Outsiders House. And uh, I thought, eh, what are the chances? And then the next day, he I got a. Uh, a, a message on Twitter from S.C. Hinton saying that he is coming to Tulsa to take her to lunch and he wants to see the house. And then when I woke up, I went I went on Instagram and he had messaged me saying the same thing. So I said, oh, cool. So I tried to keep it at a minimal. I didn't want too many people here. I told one employee Then I felt if I didn't tell the other employee that the other employee was going to get mad. <laughs> I told the one employee, so I told two employees. Then I told three employees, and at the end of the day, there was like six of us and a cameraman. Uh, it all worked out, but the, you know, the those are the problems. Uh, sure. You know, when when people come by because the uh, the privacy concerns and stuff like that. But we've had so many people come by here at this at this point that all of my employees and volunteers are kind of um, I won't say well behaved, but they're they're versed in how to handle. Uh, celebrities and people who may want their private space, not to rush them, not to bombard them for photos or autographs or any of that stuff. Because uh, I don't want people to come here, especially if they are a celebrity or in the movie, that to feel like we like jumped them, <laughs> sure, <laughs> and 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 milked them for all of their worth for the you know hour that they were here. And so we, I've kind of had to like just make sure that everybody is uh, well versed in the art, the the delicate art of you know being in the service industry and and not and not you know ODing on the fandom so and it's hard to do with this legacy this is like this is like the 80s movie that kind of spawned that kind of you know it's it's the brat pack it's like yeah. all the girls wanted to be with these guys and all the guys wanted to be these guys and so uh, you know the 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 fandom runs deep with this stuff but my my staff and the volunteers do a fantastic job and uh, it was great to see him listen I took a photo out front with uh, before he left with Matt and on one side and Essie Hinton on the other side and I was like man if it, if this is the if I die today you know I'll die a happy man because you know Dallas Winston was the character that I most yeah, yeah. you know related to as a kid so was yeah. was he just driving through Tulsa or did he come here just for that no or? so he came for an, he came for a, a friend of his is an artist and he was doing a a show in Oklahoma City I guess he had moved away and was had been in New York for the last twenty years doing his paintings and now he was coming back to Oklahoma to show his you know uh, 50 years of work and Matt was doing a Q&A session as the moderator with him so he thought well I'm an hour and 20 from Tulsa it's been a long time he knew about the museum and he knew obviously Susie still lives here so it was good on him. I mean, he, he he came in his rental car and he didn't, you know, he just drove himself to Tulsa and picked up Susie and took her to lunch and then they came here. So he went out of his way to be here, which was, uh, you know, it was impressive for me. And, and he did us a solid, you know, we yeah, had yeah. It, it, to have him here is everything to have him sign the, the actual, you know, autograph the actual house in, in our Hall of Fame, which is fantastic. And then, you know, it, it was a. Uh, 
you know, a media, we, we, we got good press off of it, good photos for the internet. And then, uh, you know, this weekend it was, was uh, traffic heavy, you know, it's like the Matt Dillon effect, you know, a couple months ago, it was the Leonardo DiCaprio effect, then yeah. it was the Green Day effect, then it was the, it just, people, every, every touring band comes through, they always try to make it out to the house, all kinds of movies are being filmed here in Oklahoma, and people always pass through, so we're, we're lucky, we get a really uh, broad uh, audience-based uh, people passing through the U.S. just on their way through find out that it's here and they stop by. And then we're not even open. We're only open three days a week to the public, Friday, Saturday, Saturday Sunday. Sunday. So I see a lot of photos of people who pass through that just happen to come by when it's closed. They go take a photo on the porch and or on the you know out in front, and then they they pound out. And then I just noticed because they tag me on the internet or they tag the house, and I go, oh wow, they did, you know. Usually it's like, you know, punk bands or <laughs> yeah, yeah. people making the trek from, you know, east to west and, have, you know, whatever. So Hitting the Midwest pipeline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, uh, what was it like meeting Leo? It, I, I, you know, I met him a long time ago in Hollywood. So I knew him when he was a young kid. Uh, my sister and, and my first, like, real girlfriend, you know, air quotes, uh, they were all they all grew up Juliet Lewis was the connection is what I'm trying to say so my sister okay. and Juliet and my first girlfriend Patricia they were all you know we we're all growing up together they were, they were younger than me Juliet was so when Juliet I think she did a TV show with Leo was the brother at, or the or the boyfriend in that in some kind of like family values or family ties show and then they did Gilbert Grape together I think or okay. maybe they didn't I don't know but it, they, I was always like the big homie and in Hollywood it's a small it's smaller than you think it is if you don't live in Hollywood and if you're in the again air quotes like the in crowd or that that young crowd that's going to the certain clubs and the certain hangouts we all knew each other but in this instance I hadn't seen him in 20 years and I remember the last time I saw him was right after the Titanic and that kiss star was like through the roof yeah and I used to run into him in New York a lot at nightclubs and um I ain't seen him since then the Soleil Moonfry Kid 90 documentary solidified his like obviously remembering oh shit Danny boys in the dock I'm in the dock he had just seen this documentary that just had you know come out a month before so when I was like Leo it's Danny boy he was like oh shit and we started laughing and talking about her documentary and how crazy it was and then I was like yo I forgot you read for the outsiders because this after the outsiders was done the movie in 90 they re tried to boot it for TV Coppola and Susie Hinton were involved in it like a TV series it or? was a TV series okay. there's a, I think there's six episodes and then they canned it it was was it good box. or not um no I think is the is the answer but it a lot of my friends were in it man David Arquette was in it um Robert Rustler was in it um Another kid whose name again, it's it's one of those days where my head is doing me in, but um there was a, Pruitt was his name. Uh unfortunately he's no longer with us. Um he passed away. But the premise was good. It basically takes place the day after Dally dies and then putting it back together. But because it was for T V and it wasn't the characters that you know as the outsiders, sure. it's new characters. It was just hard to buy into. And the nineties like the the eighties was so powerful and then it kinda just like at the end of the eighties there was like that like what's the next decade gonna look like? And then the nineties just hit so hard with like grunge and, and the second coming of hip hop, a la Cypress Hill, House of Pain, ba 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 woo whatever. It was just like in that nineties, ninety one era where it just like we weren't looking for the eighties shit anymore. You know, we were looking to carve our own way. So yeah, I I've watched I've tried to watch it. It's just too it's just too yeah, it, no, it's not great. It's not good, you know. It's not but hey, if you're a fan, might as well watch it just to see. Sure. You can see episodes on I'm sorry, I'm chewing liquor, so I gotta get some of the sugar going. <laughs> no, you're good. Um you last time I checked there were still episodes of the full complete episodes on uh YouTube. So Okay. I might, is, I'll check it out. Yeah, it's you know my Leo mom. Leo spent quite a bit of time out here with the uh, Flowers of the Killer Moon. Yeah, he was the lead in that. So, yes, he did. I, I heard he even bought a house here. I don't know if that's true or not. I didn't ask him about that. Um, do you know much about the backstory of that movie or the book? Yeah, I do. I mean, I read the book about it two years ago. So, I'm really look. I think that comes out in November, they say, yeah, or well, sometime this fall. You know what? I was telling people when they were coming here from Pahuska, because after he came, then the... Then, um, uh, the second part of the cast came through 
and uh, you, you're really stretching my, my mind right now to like <laughs> dig for the files because it's all of these names. Brandon Fraser came. I did see that picture. The the guy from, uh, and I, again, I feel terrible because they're, they're great actors and their names are just escaping me. But the guy from, I know him best from Breaking Bad. He was the redheaded dude who, at the end, he shot the kid on the oh, motorcycle. Oh, yeah, I know you're talking about. He's I a don't great know his actor. name. He was in Black Mass. He played uh, uh, Kevin Weeks. In the, he has a in lot the, of like subtle roles where he doesn't yeah, do a ton of talking. But he's great. In, yeah. I know exactly and, who you're talking about. A handful of other actors that were on the the, the the movie with with Leo came after he came here. So we, again, it was always it, we we get such a, a a wide swath of like you know everybody the drop ins. Yeah, because this this book when this movie has affected so many people in a positive way. Either you read it in seventh grade, or your big brother or sister read it, or you you remember when the movie first came out in eighty three, or you saw it in eighty six on HBO religiously because it was every late night Saturday. Saturday night movie they'd show it or whatever and then the cast went on to such great stuff and again this is a little piece of Americana this is the this is one of those iconoclastic movies where you know it, it's our generation's you know wild one or you know after the after Brando and James Dean and all of that stuff these were our guys I mean Matt Dillon was a matinee idol and everybody you know wanted to be cool like Matt Dillon or 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 Rob Lowe, you know, such a good looking dude at the time, you know, like so many girls like were like madly in love with all of the, all of them, you know what I mean? You think Ralph is the karate kid later and all of them. I mean, they just got, they either got their start at this thing or it really like propelled where they were going. They'd all had done like a movie or so prior to it, but this movie kind of like introduced us all to them and Emilio's success and all of the, there's so, there's, there's just so many layers to it. And then Coppola's hand in it. And you think you're ever going to get a Tom Cruise out here? He's um, huge. I mean, he's probably the biggest yeah, one. Yeah. Well, in 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 box office success, yes. But in my mind, like Matt Dillon was the guy, sure. you know. And if you can hear in the background, this time it's not your uh, one year old. It is actually the train going through, which yeah, is yeah. like free money for us. If you're a fan of the Outsiders, this is how the movie starts. You see Pony at the desk, and you hear the dogs in the distance, and then the train horn in the back. Which I always thought that Coppola had like inserted that into the thing but he had not and this is really the neighborhood and uh i love hearing that train it, it's like uh soothing to my ears yeah um i would love n- i want all of the actors in a perfect world to come back and just to see you know what we've built here because uh, it's their legacy you know what i mean it's like um you didn't if somebody didn't. did a house of pain museum I'd, i would make sure i'd show up <laughs> and that's not like when we built this, when I say we, because the communities helped me in every way possible. Also, the author helped me. Jack White helped me. Billy Idol helped me. I mean, they all kicked in. Uh, and Jack White gave me thirty thousand dollars when I was stuck. He's pretty and prominent here in Tulsa, right? He, uh, yeah, he bought a house here. He I thought played so. Baseball here. I was just at a baseball game today at the Sandlot. Season just started today, and I saw your jersey doing their thing. Yeah, they blessed me with the jersey. I'm just like an honorary member. They basically claim, um, you know, Crutchfield neighborhood the, and. And rightfully so, they play in Lacey Park, which is like a couple blocks outside of Crutchfield because it's a proper baseball field. Is this just like a pickup league? It is like a pickup league, I think. I don't want to do them dirty if they, if it's not, but it, yeah, it's like Sandlot. So they, they have a team. They play other local teams. Teams from Texas come in. Teams from Arkansas come wherever. They're just like the, 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 the four or five surrounding states. They okay. all kind of swap out and play each other and go on the road. And Jack White apparently has a team or plays with the team, and he has a he has a big part in a, a bat company too called Warstick. So, I would never guess that. That's pretty. Well, cool. he's a baseball fan. Is he Detroit guy? Oh yeah, and that song it's giving jump around like a, a a run for its money in the stadiums. Now all you hear is a seven man army like in the in the stadiums now. You know, oh, yeah. like that's a it's a staple now. It wasn't always that way. You sure. Know? And that song had been out for a decade before it became like prominent in the stadiums. But great guy. He loved the Outsiders, loved Tulsa, um, and really put his money worth his mouth. He didn't ask, he didn't ask me for shit, and he didn't even uh, waste time sending me the money. I mean, it came pretty quick, 72 hours, and I had the cash. Wow. And, and it all went into the house. And, you know, God bless him. Uh, Essie Hinton is, is, is the number one investor in it. And um, without her blessing, I don't know that I would have done this. You know, if she was opposed to it, I would have been like, well, I don't want to do that then. That's not cool. You yeah, know? I know I know. in a lot of the uh, 
the podcast you've done or the uh, the interviews and stuff you you essentially said this place like you you know you kind of kickstarted it but without this the people of Tulsa it would be nothing because yeah the people Tulsa here are so Oklahoma good. or 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 Outsiders fans yeah I don't believe my honest belief and this is you know if this was in LA I don't think I would have got anywhere with it I wanted to I wanted to add before we go too deep I wanted to ask you about that too that was one of my big questions so why was it I know it's based in Tulsa obviously S.E. Hinton and all yeah. that but even even movies that are based anywhere else on novels it's like everything's filmed in LA so why did they decide to film it here great question so I mean that's pretty got, pretty rare right oh, in 82 are yeah. you kidding me to bring everybody from Hollywood to Tulsa no cell phone so it's not like today where you can connect and be and throw the whole thing out of whack and bring them all here to Tulsa. He did it because he wanted to stay true to her vision in the book. The director? Oh, yeah. Coppola. Yeah. Any other director might have got shot down. You tell the studios, yeah, I'm going go to I'm gonna go to the Midwest with this thing. No, you're not. Yeah, that's a why big commitment. Why would you do that? Yeah, why would you do that? They literally were base camped out of a, a thing that's no longer there. It's where the rope course is if you came in off of uh, Peoria. But there used to be an elementary school. They had to use that as the studio because there was no studio. Where are you going to park the production trucks? Where are you going to park the cars from the movie? Where are you going to keep all the wardrobe at night? Where are you going to do the the tryouts, the fittings, the readings? Where are you going to do all that? There's no studio lot that you could do that. So they took a elementary school that was right down the street. And across from the elementary school was the park that they filmed in. One block over is the Rumble Field. One block after that is the Outsiders House. This is why all of these things got used in this neighborhood because they base camped out of this former Lowell Elementary School, which has now been flattened, and they built this ropes course for like, I don't know, it's like a, I guess originally they built it for the fire department to do like all kinds of, it like looks training like a, and stuff. yeah, but now it's for kids, but there's never anybody using it, so. That was one of my biggest questions that I had was, out of all the movies to film elsewhere that they probably could have done in Los Angeles, why would they do it here? Which is When awesome. I first found the house and on that tour and I posted on Facebook, everybody was like, where on the Warner Brothers lot is that? I didn't know it was there. <laughs> and I was like, it's, it, it, as funny as it is, it, it, chances are it probably should have been on there. You know, They just let him do it. And then he bought the rights to Rumblefish, another of Susie's books. Mm-hmm. And he two weeks after closing... The production on The Outsiders went downtown and started filming Rumblefish. That's not, that is un, so uncommon. Well, have, have you been keeping up with, uh, obviously we talked about uh, Killers of the Flower Moon, but there's a lot of filming going on in Oklahoma. Now. No, right, but not from one director. No, 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 yeah. A rollover cast with the sure. same book, the author that he's buying books off of in 82 when there's no cell phones, no internet. It was very you know how hard it is to do all that. And because they were both, you know, um, written here he just you know in particularly the outsiders he just wanted it to be here and they figured out why not do another one while he was here um yes to your point they're calling you know oklahoma the new there's a nickname for it i don't want to mess it up but it it it, it is true this is a this is a very under what's the word i'm looking underrated for? underappreciated yeah maybe. i mean he, i guess it's flyover country and people don't know what to make of it you know they don't if if you know, everybody has like a vision of what New York looks like. If, if you've never been in New York or Hollywood, what it looks like, whether it's true or not, we have like this yeah, yeah. television movie version of what we think things look like. What does Oklahoma look like? And I guess the people assume cowboys and Indians. They really do. Like, but a, lot, a lot of people from not from here associate it with uh, like the western part of the state, which okay. is like flat and sure. uh, like the... The tornado alley slash, you know. Well, and like the tumbleweeds. The plains, yeah, and, yeah. of course. But like Northeast Oklahoma is really pretty. And like I said, you know, the there's city's There's sand blue. dunes here. There's yeah. flats. There's hills. There's, uh, we have the, Tulsa has the third largest collection of Art Deco buildings. Mm-hmm. Only third to New York and Chicago. Um, we it's, it's such, there's so many looks here. It's incredible. It is a filmmaker's paradise. I know my buddy John Schwab has done like five movies in a row. He's a Tulsa native who moved to Woodstock, New York to write for years, then came back. And he's done movie after movie here. And he did a shootout scene, which they were calling like, you know, it was it was kind of like in the movie Heat at the end when they had that big shootout. Well, they did a sure. big shootout downtown on 5th and uh, South Boston. And he said when he went to the film commission to say, hey, we want to lock this street down and do a mass shootout. They were like, cool. And he goes, well, how much will it cost? They said, well, we'll get back to you tomorrow. And when they got back to him, they're like 800. He's like 800,000. Jesus, that's a lot of money. They go, what? No, $800. He was like, $800? They were like, yeah. He was like, 
let me check with my guy real quick. They started <laughs> laughing. I'm like, sure, yeah, we'll, we'll do that. <laughs> Sounds all right. They just locked it down. So people want you to, my experience is this, and I'm an outsider, no pun. Uh, I found that if you come here and you have a vision and you're willing to work for it, they'll help you do it because they want you here and they would love to see you do creative stuff here because there's a very... I don't know where it comes from, and maybe it's always been here since Will Rogers, but there's this very, I feel like if you're creative or, or, or you've, you've got some kind of idea that you want to, you, you propose to do that they are very receptive and that they being Okies and get a lot of support. Yeah. And I, you know, I feel like I used to find that in Hollywood. That was the trick. If you could make it to Hollywood, they said the odds are good, but the goods are odd, but you could say, I want to do, I want to rap and I'm a white guy and it's 1986. And they're like, cool. <laughs> Wherever else they're like, what? You, know, you, you do know you're white. Like I, that's not a possibility yet. You know, there might've been the beastie boys prior, but other than that, they're like, that's not, not a good life plan you know who knew um but those things don't exist like they used to you know it used to if you wanted to make records and rock records you had to be in hollywood you wanted to be uh, a serious actor you had to be on broadway you know nowadays you can you can kind of sub navigate that and just be wherever you be but uh there's like a renaissance going here in this uh, in, in tulsa in particular but the whole state and uh for me there's nothing better than Tulsa. I love all of Oklahoma. Uh, I'm definitely a new Okie, but my heart is in Tulsa because there's something special about Tulsa that I haven't found in every other place yet. You said Tahlequah, that's where you're from. I've been out to Tahlequah. I know Mr. Ed is buried there. He is, yeah. I've seen some really cool um, Cherokee stuff out there. I know that that's like a, a Cherokee nation is like centered. Yeah, it's in the cap cap Cherokee capital. Capital. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I went to the waterfall thing from where red fern grows kind of yeah, in that fern. area. I mean, there's so many beautiful, uh, th this is like road trip capital and I love a good road trip and we have the longest, uh, rideable route 66 route in the U S there's just so many little, um, it's the little things is what I'm getting at. You know, New York has these like these massive like you know the statue of liberty and these like these iconic things and those are great and 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 we obviously know that those are great american cities but there's something that i think we we appreciate uh that people are starting to rediscover the wonders of like the off the beaten path back to the road trip the communal experience for me sobriety did that for me i was i'm a former drug addict and alcoholic um, and coming up on 17 years sober, I say that to say that when you, you, I, I, in order to really live, I, I almost nearly died. And, and I, I've learned the value of life and the, and the value of gratitude. And it's the little things that make the big, like a, a bigger picture, if that makes sense. And I think COVID did that for the average person where like they're not a drug addict and alcoholic. They didn't have to push it to the limit to literally lose their life. But when COVID hit, it shocked the system. It shocked a lot of people, man. A lot of people refused to go back in an office again because like, fuck, oh, I yeah. want to live at home. Sure. I got my kids here. I got my family here. I can do the dishes and make sure my work is done and then be out. And you can do all of the little things at once and never have to leave the comfort of your home. But when we were had to wear masks and separate from everybody and, 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 you know, they, it, it felt good to be in a movie theater again. It felt good Absolutely. to be in a car packed with people going to Tahlequah to look for Mr. Ed's grave. And I don't know if you knew who Mr. Ed is, the famous yeah, the Mr. Horse. Ed the Horus, yeah. right? Well, you, you're younger than me, obviously. And, and kids out there who listen to this, they might not know, but that was a famous horse, uh, in a sixties TV show that's buried out there. Um, and it's the stuff that happens between, you know, the second you get in the car and the sec and the and the minute you get back. It's all. It's not really the destination that's important. It's all of the ups, downs, and all the rounds that happen in between. And I think uh, there's no place better to do that than in Oklahoma. Um, yeah, it's I too expensive in L.A. It's too expensive in New York. It's too crowded in L.A. It's too crowded in New York. And ain't nobody trying to hear your shit. It's just that's the the mentality and the attitude is like we got it we're full you know what i mean yeah and if, it, 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 or the opposite we, you know you get your hand shook and your cash took like welcome to hollywood now go home it's like that you don't find that in the i haven't found that in the midwest what i find is welcome 
uh, how can we help you? And that's refreshing, man. I, you know, I could go on and on. The the truth is, man, I found this by accident because of my love of Essie Hinton and, and The Outsiders. And then I discovered what makes this so great for me. And people ask me all the time, like, you really left LA to be here? I said, originally, I, yeah, you know, I wanted to be where the house was. It was my business, you know, uh, but I stayed here because of the people and it's the people that make the state special. So, yeah. yeah one of the, one of the quotes I had, or no, not a quote, I guess something you said was just in Tulsa and Oklahoma in general, that the, the American dream is still alive here. Unlike alive it is on the well. coast. Yeah. And you know what? Ironically, the original flag, I got here when they were first uh, voting on what, what, what the new Tulsa flag was going to be. Yeah. You know? And I saw the original one. I thought, what's wrong with that one and the original one if you haven't seen it and i i, I actually have not seen that it's really cool um, the new one's cool too but the new one's cool yeah the 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 one that i thought would have been great if it won was the safety cones there was all the orange safety cones because oh of the, the traffic yeah, yeah. The ter- just the roads uh yeah if there's something i don't like about tulsa currently it's the potholes in the roads but the, you know uh, it is what it is they'll never um, go away so you better better just go. take take one on the chin well, that's that why one. the funny that that's why the cones was great because somebody had the you know it was it, it, Somebody was clever with it and it almost won. I think it came in second place. Um, the original flag says opportunity unlimited on it or unlimited opportunity. And that's what I found here. Um, I don't think anybody's going to knock on your door and give you that opportunity and it'd be unlimited. But if you go out and look for it and work for it or, or propose it or have a dream, you can find it here. Um, I think that anytime a, a, a former great city finds it's like, mojo again it's looking for creatives we need creatives we want people to come here with their thinking cap on and their big dreams and their big you know aspirations and we want to help them because when when i win tulsa wins when you win tulsa we all win like it's the the tide rises all of our ships so i'm like i'm rooting for all of the people here even if they're kind of competitors to me i'm in the museum business yet i don't look at any of these museums as being competitive with me they're only enhancing what i do and vice versa uh the church the leon russell's uh church studios that Teresa knox has staged if you don't know about that that just opened the okay pop is coming you know soon um there's 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 woody guthrie center there's there's a billion dollar park or half a billion dollar park the the gathering place there's free concerts i mean there's there's just all of this like really cool stuff in the community that constantly keeps i think there's a lot more culture than people would assume uh, i mean that yeah that's the understatement and that that is that's what i'm saying about flyover country people don't people think it's cowboys and indians and 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 tumbleweeds yeah you know, are, are the roads paved? Like, really, dude? <laughs> like, that that only shows our ignorance, you know, as, as you know, outsiders or people who haven't come through here. Um, and I was also, and then to, to, to counter that, which is crazy, I was shocked to find out that the third, uh, the, the, the third, what is it, the third highest, uh, this state is run by oil, number one, moneymaker, gas, and tourism. And I was like, tourism, number three? I would have that's, never guessed. That's number three. And it's getting bigger. I don't know if it'll beat, you know, oil and gas, because that's what the, you know, the world runs on and we produce it. Um, but tourism is number three. I was shocked. And that's a pleasant, like, I'm in the tourism business. So, yeah, that's a great thing. But people are coming here in droves. You're going to find a lot. I mean, I get calls all the time. The guy who let you in or was staying with you until I got here because I was running late. Bill? Bill. Bill's a, a retired NYPD. He yeah, ran the hip-hop he cop squad. I mean, he's a New Yorker's New Yorker, and he just got sick and tired of being sick and tired of New, of New York bullshit, of being overtaxed and under, you know, served and, and just just all of the stuff that goes with living, you know, in New York nowadays is just too much. People want to, people want to be able to just be free and be, and have a, a you know, some peace of mind, man. Yeah, and we you were can still find that here. We were talking before and he was saying he had like a locked in rate on his, uh, his apartment, but he said most people right now were paying about five grand for a two bedroom. Yeah. And the so, same place he lives. Yeah. Well, he's got the, you, that's the old thing that you get rent controlled rent, uh, apartments and you just never give them up and you can hold on to them and get that rate. Um, yeah. LA is no different. Everything that's been on Sunset Boulevard has been kind of like ripped up. They're building high rise, you know, apartments and they start anywhere from 3,800 to, I don't know, 10, $15,000 a month. Who can afford that? Why would you want to afford that? It's like a lot, a lot of people, like a lot of famous people or people that lived in LA and in Hollywood, I read or, or hear them talk about, they say that obviously people are leaving it like crazy, but a lot of them are yeah. saying that um, like California is almost a wash right now. Like it's almost 
Like you, it's like you can't go back. It can't be salvageable the way it's headed. I, listen, I, 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 I'll agree to that. I mean, I think it could be saved, but it's, it's, it's going I, south like extremely quick. Oh yeah, listen, me and Bill were just out there. The guy I was just talking about. We, we, the homeless crisis is, 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 is insanity. It literally looks like a dystopian movie. In, well, I went, I went four years ago and I drove by Skid Row on accident. I didn't okay. even know we were headed that way. Yeah, well, that Skid Row was always there, and that's atrocious. But it was always contained within the nickel, which is that's the area that that's called. Now, if you can imagine Hollywood looking like Skid Row, under every freeway underpass, there's an encampment. And they're trenched in, and they're 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 not hiding it. They're not moving people out of there. It's I, I mean, well, I saw that I it, saw that video you and Joe Rogan had shared a while back about the the trains they wrecked. They uh -huh. robbed the merchant oh, yeah. full of that like the Amazon packages. And stuff. That that footage didn't even look real with no. all the trash everywhere. It looked like the walking like a Walking Dead scene. Yeah, or something. well, that's what I mean. Dystopian. Like it looks to me like there's a movie called They Live, and they literally had an encampment downtown LA in that film and it literally looks like that now they used to contain the homeless stuff to downtown LA right you'd have homeless people in Hollywood on Hollywood Boulevard sure but not camping out fully like you know tents and and I, I we saw them with they had TVs plugging into the street power at the park I mean it's like it's been it's like almost socially acceptable to be homeless they were like not there was no uh, stigma about it they were like and after dark man I was in 7-elevens like looking over my back like I, I'm a six foot six alpha male I'm 200 and I don't know 65 pounds and I'm nice with my hands anybody who knows me knows that and I'm in 7-eleven like like thinking I better get out of here this is not safe for me. And I knew that intuitively, like Hollywood's getting dangerous, but the California's getting dangerous again. And I have never felt like that. I felt like that before, you know, Manhattan in the eighties, you know, or even in the nineties, there's grimy parts of Manhattan. You go up to Harlem, you better be careful, man. Cause sure. they'll eat your lunch. And you kind of had to just, but I was young and dumb and, and, and willing to, you know, participate in that shit but as a as a as a as a guy who's in my 50s now like pfft, i don't want any part of that man and i don't also want to get got trying to buy some liquor shit 7-eleven you know what i mean yeah it's yeah we so, went when me and my wife went it was probably even i know it's gotten worse and worse it was yeah. probably five or six years ago so way before yeah. the pandemic and like you said people had outlets they had tvs they had couches like it was yeah. like a living room yeah under and, a freeway yeah and, uh, it's crazy if you've ever been to like a big football tailgate yeah it's crazy it was like that yeah bro i can i'm telling you and it's not only hollywood it's in anaheim it's in, in orange county it's in the beach communities it's venice there's the haves and the have nots and the divide has never been so they're the, they're obliterating the middle class and here you could get a middle class living we were just talking earlier about should have bought houses sooner you could still come here from anywhere and and houses are now three hundred thousand or i don't know what the median line is I'm, I'm sure we could google it but if you look in la and you see the median house price line you know what what the average house cost they're going to probably say like you know the high 400s but you wouldn't put your head in a house for five for four hundred thousand dollars, just they're shitty houses in Reseda in a bad gang infested neighborhood. You wouldn't live in a four hundred thousand dollar house. Trust me when I tell you that. You come here and you got four hundred thousand dollars for a house. It's you're balling. living like a you're living like almost. I don't want to say like a rock star, but you're living like like a CEO or like a or like a upper middle class. Like you make a couple hundred thousand dollar a year in L.A. type stuff, and you both your you know the. the the husband and wife are bringing in a couple hundred thousand a year. You can live large here for four hundred thousand dollar house. You could. When I first came here five years ago, there were for a hundred and fifty thousand dollars, you could get a beautiful mid century modern house in the Lortondale yeah. neighborhood over here. Absolutely, some of Midtown. Um, but now everybody's starting to find out how great it is in the Midwest, and people are buying these houses sight unseen. A lot of people from L.A., a lot of people from New York, a lot of people from Texas are coming up here. And a lot of people went to Texas from L.A., and now they're realizing that Austin is starting to be just like That's what I've heard, that LA. Austin is, is getting pretty And now crazy. all the people, I don't know, a handful of people that went to Austin, now they're like, I can't wait to get out of here. Traffic is crazy, prices are crazy, crime is crazy, homeless crisis is crazy. We don't have that here. We have homeless people, yeah. We have crime in certain areas. I get people who go, yo, I seen Tulsa on on the first, first yeah, like the cop shows. I'm like, you know what? You can go to any city in America and go to the bad part of town, and then all day long it's going to look like that. There is a part of town that I don't mess with after dark, and anything on Memorial or Mingo or... I just stay away from there because I ain't got no business where all those cheap, hot, cheap motels are. 
that we know like yeah that's every area every place has an area like that but for the most part Tulsa is like I mean yeah when, when people talk about first 48 like that aren't from Tulsa like friends that I have live elsewhere I always say I think that crime and homicide happens everywhere but they just have a we just accepted the tv show we decided yeah, to film it here and, yeah, and our, luckily our homicide unit does a phenomenal job they so do. that's why people like the show listen i'll tell you the even more ironic i was just at uh i was just with uh with sean larkin aka sticks yeah yeah i listened to that episode i was at yeah but i was just no i was just at snoop dogg and ice cube oh really you know they're up in there you know yelling fuck the police and then there's sticks and the whole cop squad <laughs> in there listen only in tulsa this happens you know what i mean it's like uh, they get they, these dudes do their thing and they don't take themselves seriously the, all the all my friends that are cops are that way you know yeah, but yeah. my point is is like man tulsa is a good place you know and um compared to the coastal cities you know I, I just wouldn't feel safe doing what i what i used to do there and i can't afford to just you know to to, to live the way i mean uh anyway i how was the snoop show snoop show was cool snoop always puts a good show on if i'm being honest ice cube stole the show because i've seen snoop before you know and i think snoop does the same type of show you know but and it's been a long time I, I never saw ice cube live actually to think of it and i always loved ice cube's music um i but, just thought it was funny for cube to i didn't go to the show but because um, you know he was doing the rap thing for a while and then he kind of transitioned into those movies that were sure, like pg-13 yeah, and course, now he's going back to, yeah, to doing well, the rap show hey listen we should be so lucky you know he can he can flip go back and forth to the yeah. max and still make his money good for him um yeah no i liked ice cube stuff i you know we've People think I came out and did jump around with him. And I actually reached out to Snoop, but I didn't hear back. He does jump around in a lot of his sets. He did on night two, but I never heard back regardless. Um, you were thinking about coming well, out to do it? Or? Yeah, we do. he flew us out there one time to do it in Ireland just because he got kicked out of England on a show. And he's like, he called Everlast and was like, yo, if you guys want to come out, I'll fly you first class, put you up. So I, you know, I would have never asked in LA or New York or any of that shit. I could care less. I don't even go to rap shows anymore and hadn't for years but because it's Tulsa and I live at the Mayo which is right across the street and everybody's mm -hmm. always like hey I got extra tickets for you I really literally w roll out of bed walk over across the street and I'm in the suites and right. just doing my thing and I thought well it would be cool for me here in Tulsa to come out and do it but today I was a few different places people were like man good seeing you on the show uh, and I wasn't even there the second night but apparently he did jump around and someone was out there so I don't, they thought it was me and I just was like I didn't even say that I was like okay so it is what it is. But yeah, man, again, that's another perk, man. We got the Canes Ballroom, which is the legendary, you know, uh, old school honky tonk where everybody who's anybody has played there on their, you know, on their come up. On their, on their and, rise, yeah. yeah. And then now we got the BOK Center for the last decade or so, which is like, you know, they're Barclays. doing crazy shows. Right they now. get all of the shows. So anything that's playing at like, you know, Barclays or Staples Center, well, they'll start off here to, you know, Kick it off. shake off the rink rust or whatever and get their licks back and then by the time they hit LA or New York they're you know they're coming in hot but yeah there was like Bieber was here Snoop Dogg yeah. Sl even Slipknot I mean yeah. a lot of yeah. a lot of different groups I've seen everybody from Willie Nelson to Tool to U2 to Guns N' Roses to I mean who haven't I seen and that's I've been in more concerts since I moved to Tulsa than in my whole entire life and I was in the concert business performing and being at concerts and I usually don't go to concerts in LA because be, between the traffic and the parking and just the, the all the, the shenanigans, I was just like, can't be bothered. <laughs> can't be bothered here. It's, it's, it's actually nice to go because you guys are real fans and you really appreciate music. A lot of times, in, especially in LA with everybody with their camera phone up and not enjoying it, and it was just like too much, but. I, I did have a question about that for, for back when you were in, in House of Pain and when yeah. things were popping off. Because nowadays, you know, with the, I guess they call it going viral. It's really easy to do. And just a big part of it is social media. How did you guys know you made it? Like, what was it as a performer back then? Was it being on the like top 10 on the radio or was it seeing I mean, the yeah, music we blew video? Up the, the song blew up so big, it was hard not to know. I mean, but that was a phenomenon. I mean, that's what makes it phenomenal. Like, this song just transcended, like, everything at that time. I mean, we put out the single and immediately started getting radio play and every time a DJ would put it on the whole club would like they would tear the club up and it was like whoa like it was even for us and, I, and I'm un I'll include Everlast and I'm sure we were all like good lord this is a powerful song unlike just a hit song or you know whatever and 
it, the, the, we, we know that's true because you, it's still at every stadium, at every football game, every baseball game, just yeah. about everyone. Have you seen the people hyped up? Yeah, of course the Badgers are going to. Oh say, man, of course. Yeah, that that's that's electric. Dude. I met a guy who said, man, he was part of the 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 think tank that had to get the seismologists out there to make sure that the stadium could withstand. 80,000 people jumping around. Yeah, because college football is usually your biggest amount of people you can get in one sitting. 70, yeah. 80,000. Could yep. be more, especially with the tailgaters. And, uh-huh. the, and they had to make sure that, that that could withstand that many people jumping simultaneously up and down. Yeah, that video. The, or, oh, I know. It gives me chills, rocking. man. I know. It's, it's crazy. So when you, back when you were, you know, in, in House of Pain and Active, it was, I assume to make most of your money, you had to sell records and do shows and sell merch. Yeah. And now, nowadays that streaming is here. Yeah, it's do, crazy. Do you still get paid off of streams? Is that uh, well, for artists? Yeah. I don't know how that works because I don't get paid off any of that shit. Uh, I made my money off the t-shirts. I was, I started the band. It was my name, my logo, my concept. Everlast was the, 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 the the driving force lyrically and writing wise and lethal and mugs were producing. So everybody got paid. I got paid more than everybody at the, out the gate because merchandising, nobody thought of it as like being serious money. And they get, I got 60% of it and we turned on so many people to house of pain and that Irish thing that we were selling merch like through the roof. So it made me, you know, a lot of money really quickly. Sure. But if you're not touring and you're not you're not relevant in that way anymore, the merch goes down to a trickle. I read I, I listen and read a lot of stuff about artists and one of the common things that some of them would say is so I've, you're going to be fond of your music. It's your music and you think it's it's good, but a lot of their biggest hits they didn't think were going to be that good. They they have like Steve I read Steve Aoki's book and he had no idea that like uh, some of his biggest hits, he said I thought they were okay. On, from, from his personal perspective. Sure. And then they ended up being his top two, top three. Did you guys? Well, I mean, that would be a question for Everlast because he wrote it. When I heard, when he brought it back from the studio the day that he came back from the studio and he played the three song demo that he had just did with Muggs, it was Put Your Head Out with Be Real, Come and Get Some of This and Jump Around. And they were all great, but Jump Around was a clear standout. And it was. Everybody in my living room was walling out like it just had the like, we were all, you can't fake that in front of your own, like sure. if I'm playing something and you start going, oh hell yeah, <laughs> I'm like, you're not going to break that for me, you're not going to, and every time I played it every everybody else would get an earful, we're like, what is that song? I They were asking like through the windows, like well, what are you playing? What is that shit? I keep hearing it, like that's crazy song. I just knew we played it. They played it. Our manager had a club at the time. She did a night uh, at this place called Guadalinda and she played it and the place went nuts. And it's like, these are some of our friends, some strangers, some, like, you just can't fake it. If you put a song on and the place reacts, you just, and we thought, okay, maybe it's just local. And then no, everybody started finding out. So yeah, I, I didn't write it. So as soon as I heard it, I knew it was a hit knew it was a hit. it just had a vibe that just and make you jump around which is i, which is I nice. thought it was kind of ironic uh i got a book for christmas uh about robin williams his life and just made me think one of the i think the first time i ever heard jump around was in miss doubtfire oh, yeah, that's right. at his birthday that was party the, i think that was the first movie it was ever in really yeah uh-huh. yeah i love i love well i love robin williams and i love that movie and i was thinking yeah, that's the, Pete, the first time i ever heard that so yeah yeah, that was the first, I, I believe, I'm pretty sure that that was the first movie that it ever appeared in, which was a big deal at the time. You know, all of that stuff was a big deal. Yeah. That, you know, you may not know because you're younger, but being a white group in hip hop and being in the early 90s, there was a big deal about selling out and not selling out. We had to really be careful. There was a lot more money we could have made, but it would have been considered selling out. Today, there's no such thing as selling out. If you're a rapper and you get a beer commercial or you get a movie and they use your... You just take whatever you can. Of course. Who wouldn't? But you can't... But back back then, you you couldn't. couldn't. You had to be careful. You couldn't do a beer ad because you're like, yo, you selling it? You selling out, man? You ain't not. Nah, it's not real. It's not like it wasn't street anymore. You were giving it up to the corporation. So we had to really dial it back. Really, we didn't accept a lot of offers that we could have. You got. declined a lot of offers because yeah, of your all the, reputation. all the time. So I remember Mrs. Doubtfire was almost like a, you know, listen to this day. I don't think you. It's happened a few times. I know because I can think of a movie even back in the day, but you can't get. Um, I know that like Led Zeppelin would never license for a commercial. Uh, when Ad Rock, I mean Ad Rock, <laughs> when MCA first died, there was a statement that his like Will said like they will never use his music in commercials. He won't allow it. 
then it did happen a couple of years later. But his his will stipulated that his part, which is weird too, because there's three people in the band, but like he didn't want his music being used for commercial reasons. But maybe the Beasties got bills to pay, and they're like, "Nah, I mean that was cool for the couple of years." But that that's even now. It's it's iffy if you license it to certain things, especially if you don't believe in that or you're not feeling that topic of the movie. But we passed up on a lot of stuff back then that probably would have been beneficial. Even uh, we, there there should have been a beer commercial in there for Mickey's early on. You know, there could have been all kinds of like stuff like that. But the it, the, the world's changed. I see these kids now. I made a million dollar. Uh, my my first merch deal was a million dollars, one 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 point two five. What does that consist of? Like, what's a merch deal? Basically, we, we licensed the the merchandise to a company that prints and and delivers and sells it to all the record stores and then follows you on tour and sells it at your events. And you got one point two five million. Yeah, in the nineties. Nothing. Yeah, ninety two. And there's nothing wow. ninety three. And there's nothing to recoup either. In other words, like if you get a record deal for. 200,000 you have to make the record with that money so you might spend 150 on oh so that's record, before your and expenses then, and stuff. yeah and then okay. right after your lawyer your accountant your lay, you're left with whatever what's left it's not it goes right to your pocket the so merch you, deal goes to your pocket you got so one one two five i got 60 percent of that so i got like four hundred eighty thousand dollars of the first check and i forget what and i'm like 21 wow. at the time it's a lot of money but i say that to say now and we other rappers, the the generation before us didn't see that kind of money. They didn't see no million dollar t shirt deals. It's, there wasn't even t shirts at merch. Very rarely did you see merch being sold. The Beasties did it well. Run DMC for a time. You know, you said the, the Together Forever tour. They probably sold a shit ton of merch. But I didn't remember seeing like UTFO and wanting a t shirt. It was always t shirts in the parking lot that were bootleg that, you know, oh, yeah. dudes were selling, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Because hip-hop wasn't there yet. I say that to say that, and I see these kids nowadays, you never even heard of them, but they sold, they got a 40 million views on YouTube, and they they got so much money, they don't know what to do with it. Well, now you can, well, if you're the right person, you can post a picture on Instagram and tag a company, and you just get a check. All you do is post a picture. Yeah, I don't know. And so we live in a different world. I keep, I have a a blue check on my um, Instagram, and I don't even have that many people. I got like 17,000 people. And when I post a video, it asks me if I want to do this and get paid the potentially twelve hundred dollars a month. And I don't even understand what it's asking me because I have to. Then it goes to a next like, it just looks complicated to me. I'm like, nah, I'm good. I'm just I don't do it for that. But yeah, they want to give incentives to constantly post yeah. content for them, and I'm like, I don't even post like that. I don't even know what that stupid stories thing. I don't even use that for the most part. Sure. I just don't care. You know, I'm 53 years old, bro. Like the fact that like, you know, I run like five different pages cause I got a, you know, I, I, I got a few different things uh, that I, I take care of and just basic posting and making sure that is cool enough. But I don't even, TikTok is a whole other, like what the hell is going on there? I just, there was a kid here yesterday. She was doing her little dance with the music in the front. I'm like, are you TikToking? She's like, yep. And she did it 30 times because it wasn't, oh, man. man, I'm glad I wasn't a kid. I was, I, listen, I was a brand when, when nobody knew what a brand was. In other words, like they thought a brand was some product you bought at the store and that is a brand, but I was a brand. House of Pain is a brand. I mean, we were like, we were different in hip hop in the way that, that like, you know, other groups before us wasn't, we were the white guys that were tough guys that would punch you in your face. And we did hardcore hip hop with Cypress Hill who were also punch you in your face type Latin dudes that were coming from a whole day with the New York style, but we were based in LA and there was there, we were a brand and we got, we brought a, a millions of white boys out the, out the closets, if you will, that were like, hell yeah, I'm Irish too. And wilding out to that shit. And so I know what it's like to be a brand my whole life. These kids now are forced to be a brand. Like they don't even, if it didn't happen on the internet, did it happen? Like it's like, you got to prove it to somebody. Yeah, you got to show everyone like, you did it. You got to constantly produce content or you're not even relevant anymore. Yeah. Like I didn't have to do that. We just got on our BMXs as kids and went to the park and looked for other kids to ride bikes with or go to the video game, go to eight salt fish and chip and stand in line to play Donkey Kong. It was like so easy to be a kid. And if you said swear words or you said something that was politically incorrect in the eighties, that's all we did was say slurs racial sure. curse whatever i'm just glad i wasn't on my twitter to be thrown in my face at a, at a future date yeah like 10 years that down was, the road there was no malice in my heart we were just kids we just we just we cut low 
Yeah, we it, said the worst possible thing, the fastest out the tongue. You know what I mean? That's we bagged each other. There was bagging and crumbing. That's what we did. We just shit on each other for a sport. We were so fucking, you know, it just that's what we did. Well, nowadays when someone's in the spotlight for for anything, like I uh, one I know is uh, people guys about to go to the NFL draft. Baseball too. They Baseball. go and they dig through all of their old stuff and they go, Years oh, he back. was a number one prospect, but he said the N word to his boy, not even like at somebody. So it wasn't saying like, oh, that dude who happens to be African American is a N word. It was like talking the way it was almost. It was there was a time. Listen, it was socially acceptable to to speak that way if you felt that you had that hood pass and and people might not understand that now because it's we're such at a different cancel culture sure. you know uh uh world but there's uh, that word come out of my mouth a thousand times and you know what it's just we live in a different world now and it's not okay to say that right but if hey yeah kids if they're saying it to their other friend that a white guy to a white guy saying that to the thing Yo, and then they they made the mistake to tweet that in 2006. Now they don't have a baseball career. And that's wrong. In my heart, that's wrong. And that could be coming the other way too. It's not because they're white. and It's because words have meaning and they're powerful and you should be careful. And there's nobody who regrets the things he said more than me. The more I found out about myself doing like the work and sobriety and getting to, you know, going do my steps and do my thing. What I found out was that, you know, I had said a lot of stuff that I had regretted to people that were the closest to me that hurt them the most. And I was careless with my words. And as I get older, I learned not to be so careless. It's tough because it's just, I think I'm being clever. I think I'm being quick witted and I'm saying it at your expense, you know, and not realizing that hurts. It was public or it was in a situation where you were like, you felt compromised and I only dig, dug the knife in deeper to have a laugh at your expense, you know, or something like that. So I, I, I try not to be careless, but as a 20 year old, as an 18 year old, as a 17 year old, those, that wasn't even, that concept was so foreign. I wouldn't understand it. I, I would, I wouldn't understand it uh, five years ago. It just takes what it takes to you get to a level where you can comprehend, oh shit, that makes sense to me now. Sure. That would have never, older and I would have just thought, You're, why are you trying to tell me how to talk? That was my mentality. Like, I'll do whatever I want, G. Like, I'll say, how, I'll say, and this, that, that, blah, blah, blah. We just talk crazy. And the worst that could happen, you get punched in your mouth. And I could, you know, and I didn't really never get punched in my mouth. So I'm like, I'll say whatever I want, when I want. I don't live in that world anymore. And I don't want to live in that world. I want to be, you know, but I have empathy for kids, all shapes, sizes, and color, to say something that they regrettably immature or stupid, even if it is with malice, even if they were if they were in the heat of the moment, they said something they regret. You're gonna now paint that person for the rest of their life as a racist, as a bit, at the this, at the that, at the that. It's like nah, that people change, people say stupid stuff. And I just, you know, I'm not big on, I'm big on redemption because I'm a redemption story. So my heart always goes out to that. I'm just glad that I'm not a kid anymore in this era. Or I didn't grow up in an era where everything is being recorded. Everything that you post can and will be used against you. And the internet is forever. Yeah. Well, that's forever. that's kind of like you mentioned right now. You just said, I've, I've said the N word a thousand times and no one will think anything of it and you're forgiven and it's good and you regret it. But if you put it on paper digitally, mm. it would go crazy. Oh, I know. People would come at you with pitchforks, but... I know. And as I was saying that, I thought that there I go, just, you know, that could be used against me. I I mean, listen... uh, Since it's it's not online, though, it's a whole different ballgame. It won't be. No, I know. But I'm just... my, my, My thing is this, you know... If they can see it or hear it, no, it holds course. so much more weight. And if somebody wants to use it against me, that's what they're going to do. My whole thing is, is this, man. At um, least you're an honest man, and you said, you know. And that's where I, my, 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 my life's in God's hands, man, not in, in man's hands. And, you know, for a long time, I felt like my, my destiny was in somebody else's hands, whether that was the hands of the band. So if Everlast wanted to do this, then I had to do that because my future was in that. And I wasn't going to get paid to do this if I couldn't do that. And, and this probably means nothing to somebody. I'm seeing a lot of like vague stuff. My point is, is this, like the band I used to think made me, I made the band. You know, Eric made the band, the Lethal made the band, Muggs made the band. Didn't you know the band? If the band makes you, you're fucked. You know what I mean? If the if this museum makes me, yeah, it makes. I make a living from this, and I do a few different things to make a living. Um, it's just a part of your equation, though. right? But in the past, I was 
my my self esteem and my my who I was was based on how well the 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 band did or how well you thought of the band or how well you thought of you know and if it slumped my 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 I was on the I was garbage and if it was high I was like better than everybody else I don't live like that anymore I've said and done a lot of stuff that I regret um and you know what I've done I made my amends where I where I could make them and I and I don't live like th that anymore and uh, you know what? I'm an advocate in, in, you know, it's not what I do for my life's work, but my, my heart is with people who, who I do. I, I've seen change because I've changed and I've also seen change in people that I thought they were never going to get sober, never going to change their life, never stop doing crime, never stop lying, whatever, whatever their thing was or their ism. I've watched people um, miraculously when they put when when they put in an effort and they try to do something different for change change is always possible and uh so I, i'm big on that so i don't care what somebody's done in the past per se there are certain things that that you know not unredeemable yeah. yeah 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 i mean yeah do you go to the the coffee shop out by the the cinema that you're uh, i don't but i know about a shebrews shebrews yeah we yeah. went there yesterday okay somebody threw a rock through it or something last week or somebody crashed into it i don't know i didn't see it it didn't yeah, look damaged but... window yeah it was no big deal but i mean it was a big deal if it's your coffee spot i don't say that lightly but yeah i don't know somebody had thrown a rock through the thing I could, we went you there know what yesterday, so. people go through people fly by that street anyway you, yeah the rock from your tire could kick up sure. and, and literally do that i'm not saying that that's what happened I, who knows but i there used to be another coffee spot that i went in that same location it just changed hands and changed names. So no, I haven't, but I was at the Circle Cinema today. We do meetings there. We, we do AA meetings there, which is uh, also fantastic. Yeah, I see you post, post about that quite a yeah, bit. Yeah, man. But uh, getting back to that, you know, listen, um, people change and you have to allow people to change, you know? I don't, you, you know, there's a body of work and, and that's what I try to judge people by and I would like to be judged by that as well, you know? My body of work, like I said, is is what, what you see, the works I do now, is is where I'm at now, and I, I hope people will, will will judge me for that, and and not for the the immature, emotionally charged bullshit that used to run through my head, and I would just spout out anything at the at the drop of a hat because I felt it was my right to free speech or be a dick, you know, uh, and I I try not to behave, I don't behave like that anymore, and uh, yeah, um, I don't know, I think that you know. This is why I love the outsiders, man. I saw a bunch of damaged people, you know, in that book. Uh, Johnny Cade, you know, his parents are beating themselves, you beating each other up, and he doesn't feel the love at home, so he runs away and he's living over here, across, you know, down the street with the with the Curtis family per se, and he gets beat up by the Soch who puts you know hands on him and he's got rings and cuts his face up, so he's. He's scared to, to, you know, move without his people. And Dally is this guy who keeps going in and out of jail. And he has a soft spot for little Johnny. So he's the protector in that. There's something like very, you know, that that was the thing that always like uh, stood out to me. And I, all I ever wanted was a gang of dudes that could run around and and have my best interest and me have their best interest, you know. And uh, I think my life would have been different if I had two parents uh, that would have been together and loved each other that I would have found sports and I would have found, you know, the right ways to channel that teen angst and that miss, you know, someone to guide you and say, nah, that ain't, you know, but when you don't have it, that's what you do. You, you start running with gangs, you start running with clubs. You know, I was in outlaw motorcycle club. I was, in a, you know, Which a couple one? different, I'm not going to tell you, I'll tell you off the thing. But, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I, uh, you know, and, and I, you know, I had a gang before House of Pain, which was, you know, we were in, we, it was real. And I'll tell you that off the thing too, it was a punk rock gang. And at the time in the eighties, there was a lot of LA punk rock gangs, no different than Suicidal Tendencies has a gang. I don't know if you know that or not. If you ever seen Suicidal Tendencies in the eighties, you saw Sueys in the crowd. Anybody listening to this who knows, knows it's a Venice gang and Suicidal Tendencies is a gang off of Venice 13, which is, a, which is the Mexican street gang. But a lot of those dudes are from Suicidal the gang yeah, I didn't know. and there was 40 to 100 of them at any gig and you would get the, you could get you, you lumped up if you <laughs> you try to you know get wild and so we a lot of other gangs started to form as their bands were playing to just to survive punk gigs and so we had a gang like that 
uh, which really got rolled into House of Pain. That same energy got rolled into that. No different than Suicidal had a gang and a band. We had a gang and a band, which was Mickey Mouse Club. It was a, it was it was legitimate. I, at 17, I was arrested for uh, attempted murder. Really, someone got shot. So yeah, and it, I had cases prior to that as well. So attempted murder. Had, uh, wow. Yeah, it was a conspiracy to attempted murder. My lawyer said, "Did you do it?" I said, "No." He said, "Fuck," because it would have been easier to get you off on attempted murder than the conspiracy charge because conspiracy means that you plan to do it and they don't even have to prove, they can prove by you bringing a gun and you at that location that you conspired to kill somebody. This was in LA? Yeah. This and was you, did, LA. you did time or no? No. I, well, no. I, yeah, they came and kicked the door in and, and pulled me out. They pulled four people out. Two people went to prison and two people walked. The two people who walked are the two people who didn't talk. No talk. <laughs> You walk. No one talks. Everyone walks. Uh, yeah. And um, you thought you would maybe go to. You thought you. Oh, I thought I was going to go to prison too, but I didn't tell on myself, and I didn't tell on anybody else. The two dudes who told on, they minimized their part and maximized everybody else's part. So they said we did it, and and the two dudes that walked, me and another guy, we just said we we don't we're not saying we were there, we weren't there. We're just saying we're not going to talk. We want to see a lawyer, you know. And so we, we, they didn't get to get a statement. So when it went to court, six months into the court case, the two guys who gave statements, they basically put themselves there with the guns. And we didn't put ourselves there because we refused to, to tell the officers any investigating. They had nothing except for hearsay. So they said, these two, I, we can't let kick them out of the case. It's too hard to prove. These two who've told on themselves with the hearsay and their statements, they, they basically put themselves in prison by talking about it to the cops. What's it? Uh... <laughs> and then I said, like, uh, and then two days ago, I'm at the guy who let you in the house, my yeah, good Bill. friend Bill's a re retired NYPD. One of my best friends in L.A. is LAPD gang unit guy now. I'm at the cops watching, you know, uh, with, with Cube sticks. do fuck the police with <laughs> sticks. It's like, bro, we live in a, in a, in a bizarre world. Uh, and my life has changed 180. So That's what know, I, was I don't get down like that no more, you know. Is when you stopped... Uh, probably disliking or hating cops and then bridging over to being your, your I never hated cops you know I, I I was I'm not one of those I guess I didn't no that's I fine but a lot of people do yeah listen and you know what there's some there's some negative shit and jump around it says I never eat a pig because a pig, pig is, is a, a cop, cop and I never liked that line but I own I, and, and I don't know that I've ever talked about this publicly especially on a podcast or anything like that but I've thought about that a lot, and it was always a cringe thing to me, but I rode with that, meaning I, I enjoyed the fruits of that success, and I never said a fucking word about not liking it until recently when I really started to dissect everything and look at my life. So I'm equally as culpable as the guy who wrote it, you know what I mean? As well, far sure as the like the, wrote it, it was, was probably Eric. more satire. No, it was right? Everlast. But I mean, it would, no, at the time that was like the, the riots had just happened. The Rodney oh, King okay. thing had just happened. And everybody so this was, before me, I was like four yeah, or five. So, so everybody in the streets in LA were like, you know, fuck the police. Okay. So the first song on Cypress's album is called pigs. And they're talking about fuck the pigs. And then, so Everlast took that energy and put it into jump around as well. And I just never liked it. Cause I was always like the, the ironic thing is when I'm not doing crime, the cops don't fuck with me not <laughs> for any reason, black, white or pinstriped. And believe me when I tell you growing up in, in the San Fernando Valley where I grew up, which is suburbia, the way I dressed, the way I talked and the people I hung around with, if there wasn't it, 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 somebody to profile, it was me. Because I stuck out, you know what I mean? And if you anything that sticks out gets hammered, you know what I mean? If, sure. if it starts to look like a nail, it gets hammered. And so I stuck out with the regular preppy, normal, you know, middle-class white kids. I did not look like that. I did not talk like that. I did not hang out where they hung out. So it is what it is. Nowadays, it seems so like it's so easy. For, I see kids with Ramon shirts and faux hawks and, you know, kids with baseball caps and people like you had to pay a price for that back in the day, my man. And you go to the mall and get lumped up or get threatened or get chased out because people like, you know, call you the F word, which is not the fuck word. It's the, the other word that can get you canceled. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, I said that word a thousand times, if not a million times as well, in the same vein of like, you know, this is how we talked back in the day. It's not as a, as a hate crime or, whatever, you know, it was just a emasculating to a next guy, you know. But you, if you had, I had bleach blonde hair at one point, early, even in the House of Pain shit, I had, you know, you could be somewhere and someone yell out the, you know, the F word to you because just, you didn't look like they looked in that, in that neighborhood or that city or that mall. So then what it's a, well, it's an instant fight right there or what? Oh, of course. Or it's an instant, I'm by myself and there's 10 dudes at the top of the thing yelling it down. So you got to scoot? 
Just keep walking, you know. But you paid a price for it. You paid a price for being a white b-boy in a hip hop at the time, but it was a badge of honor. Just like getting kicked off the first tour we ever went on with the Beastie Boys was a badge of honor. Like if you're gonna get kicked off a tour, might as well get kicked off by the, you know, the Beastie Boys who were supposed to be the worst when it comes to like touring and the, the all the, 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 you know, the craziness that was supposed to happen. They kicked you out? Oh yeah. For what? Um, they just said you're good. You're, no, you're we were just too crazy for them. I bought my first AK-47 on that tour. What? Everlast mushed out their tour manager when he tried to come on a tour bus. He basically physically punched him through the fucking tour bus door and ended up on the ground. We, we, we were just not... Our energy and their energy was two different energies, bro. And, and they just said, you're, you're done? Yeah, six shows in, they're like, fuck these guys, we're done. <laughs> I was like mortified. I thought we were done. It was our first ever tour. We end up going out and selling double and selling out every show we did after that for for a long time. But what do you now? It's a badge of honor. You know, I do MCA day. I speak at the the events talking about the friendship and the the ups the downs and everything in between. What a fan I was of the Beastie Boys and still am. Um, you know, I ran into Ad Rock a few different times. It's, it's always it's, it's love. It's just at that time we just couldn't work together while we were going through like our growth phase of being twenty something having a million dollars in our pocket and thinking that we were going to do license to ill part two. They had already done what we had done three, four years before. And they were done with that style of like living. We were just, just, just you know, coming up getting, on it, coming up on it and like reinforcing the shit that they sold us, which was like not what they were doing anymore. It wasn't true to who they were. That was actually true to who we were. We like to you drink, fight and fuck. And anybody <laughs> we punch her, we'd head, but each other, if there was nowhere to fight, we'd fight each other. That's how we'd get down. Like, you know, Shit, yeah. you know. You ever look back and think how many times you should have died? Probably. Oh yeah. Well, like I said, you know, how many you never close really calls lived until you nearly died. When you, when you, yeah, there's been a a a, a lot of, of 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 seconds and inches. You know, seconds from this, inches away from that. Um, it's where my gratitude comes from now because I really do enjoy life. It doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean it's perfect. I've had a lot of good things and a lot of good fortune come my way and I've also had a lot of awful terrible experiences with all kinds of things and um, I choose to focus on the gratitude part and you know I learned a lot from sobriety man and watching other people and how they handle things in life uh, real things like losing loved ones or getting cancer or crazy things where I haven't you know I've had that but not you know cancer and I've you know um, and watch people walk through things with grace and dignity. I always thought you had to go kicking and screaming and blaming everybody and pointing the fingers. And what I learned that was that everybody, p pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. And I can experience the pain, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and, and then it's done. Or I can hold on to the suffering and constantly remind myself that life sucks and this shouldn't happen and blah, blah, blah. And I don't do that anymore and I didn't really do that that wasn't my thing, but I, I, I could, I, there was a time, I mean, my drug addiction showed up. I wasn't a drug addict until the house of pain fell apart and I had no B plan. Everlast went on and got a Grammy and sold millions of records. Lethal went on to Limp Bizkit and sold millions of records. And I'm like, what the fuck? And I didn't know what to do with myself because I'm the, the interior decorator of the band, if you will. You know, I do the logos, the merch, the hype man, the, but when you don't have a band, it's like being a car dealer, uh, I mean a car detailer when you have nobody wants you to detail their car. You're like, what do you do with that skill? You know, when the, so I didn't have a, I didn't have a fallback thing. So I started to do drugs to feel better about the, like the, the, the dead end that I was sure, at. Emptiness. Yeah. And yeah, and if I was, if I was right sized, I would have just went out and tried to find something to do, whether that was working at Starbucks or whatever. But I'm an egomaniac at that time with low self-esteem, you know? And so I'm too cool for Starbucks and I'm too stupid to work the cash register there, there anyway. So I'm stuck in the middle of this like, poor me. And then I started just pouring me more dr drinks. And then I, I like to drink so much that I, I found accelerants to keep me drinking for longer and longer. And uh, before long I had a nice little methamphetamine habit and, and was drinking around the clock and it was either jails, institutions or death that's promised to alcoholics and addicts and uh, got real close to all of those things. And you know, by the grace of God, I, I rediscovered sobriety. I had three and a half years at one point and thought I only had a drug problem in the past and that I could just drink, you know, why couldn't I drink? Like socially? Dish? Yeah, and I tried that, it lasted 72 hours. It didn't even last that long, but within 72 hours, I was right back calling the drug 
connect and uh, I was right back on drugs. So there is hope. There is a way out. I know that uh, unfortunately we just lost a great drummer who I actually saw play when he was the drummer for uh, Alanis Morissette while we were on tour with House of Pain in the late 90s. And then he joined Foo Fighters, uh, Taylor Hawkins, is that mm-hmm. his last name? I, was, I think that is. Yeah, I just saw yeah, that a couple days ago. Yeah, overdosed on, it was think, an on idea. heroin. Yeah, and um, you know, listen. Um, well, the book I'm reading with, with Robin Williams, supposedly he was, you know, he did cocaine when he got to L.A. And I think he had a pretty oh, bad yeah. drinking problem. Oh, I'm only about a quarter All the comedians at the comedy store, they were all hooked on everything. Man, that's that that's what it said it. in the first 30 pages. Yeah. It was like. Polly Shore, I, you know, I basically grew up with him. His mother and You grew father, up with Polly Shore? Yeah, okay, I mean, in peripheral, I didn't grow up. But right. by the time I hit Hollywood, we were already friends with Polly Shore. Just in Shore. cahoots, I Yeah, gotcha. I still talk to Polly. But Polly's parents own the comedy store. So Mitzi Shore is yeah, his yeah. mother and his dad, Sammy, the comedian. We, so. When we went to L.A. to visit that one time, we went to the, the comedy store. We, so. do our, we did our, our meetings at the comedy store as well. Oh, really? Yeah, I, just, I, didn't, I, had, I had Polly on my podcast four or five years ago. I just saw him somewhere. He was supposed to come to Tulsa, and he, he's in Oklahoma City, and then he didn't call. Do you know uh, Argus Hamilton? Of course. You know he's, he's sober long term. Yeah, you know he's from Poto, Oklahoma. Mm-mm. Poto, Poto is a small town like Tahlequah, probably smaller. Wow. Yeah, it's gotta be because I never heard of it. It's small. He's uh, a great guy, and he's long term sobriety. I mean, he's he's yeah. He got sober at the. He was in the seventies on like the late the Johnny Carson. And yeah, yeah. And the, oh yeah. When we went to Good the dude. when we went to the comedy store, we were sitting there, and he opened. He's there. Yeah, yeah he's he was. Always there. He said something about uh, you know Boomer Sooner, and he was like Poto, Oklahoma, and I was like, what? You're, and I tried to catch him after because they hang around, but of he course. was he was way gone. But yeah, he's I guess he's from Poto, but. Uh, he made a lot of cocaine jokes and stuff. Of course. And drinking jokes. Bit, and, yeah, of course. But I saw the other day he posted on his Instagram that he'd been at the comedy store for like 46 years or some yeah. crazy shit. Yeah, and he's, like I said, he, I'm... He's an Okie, so... And, and there's another one, and his name, Court, is his name. Court. Court McGowan, or Court... Mm-hmm. He's a comedian. He's from Tulsa. He's out there? Yeah, and he's at the comedy store all the time. And yeah, another good. And then I, when I first discovered this Tulsa, and then I got discovered Oklahoma, and then I was still back in LA. I saw him. He's like, man, I can't believe you found Tulsa. I grew up there. I was like, yeah. I was like, boomer. He's like, hell no. I was like, what? Did they say something wrong? Because he was like an OSU. OSU, fan. yeah. <laughs> Most Which is like Bloods and Crips to to right. Okies. Yeah. I didn't know that. I mean, you know, in LA, it's a little excessive. But... It is. Well, Bedlam or whatever. Oh, that's yeah. the like. Yeah, you you find out quick how serious they take their uh, college football here. It's a little too much, in my I'm opinion. I'm a Notre Dame but... guy, and I, I'm not going to lie, and this is probably something I also, because of being diplomatic, I've never said, but I don't I don't care either. If I had to pick one, it would definitely be uh, OU. I just like the crimson and cream. I think, actually, it's... You it's, got a crimson-style hoodie yeah, on. Yeah, and it's known that... Uh, I think Notre Dame stole the uh, play like a champion today. Originally, it was quoted that the Oklahoma Sooners had that in their on a sign oh, really? somewhere and that it was actually poached. But I'm a Notre Dame fan. But I would rock the OU stuff. I just don't like orange so much. So That's it's the color thing. It's an association. Yeah. Then it is like, I like the shooting logo guy. Oh, like the, the pistol old, fire. Yeah, yeah. The pistol fire. But yeah, man. Anyway, this whole thing, like I said, you know, you talk about hip hop and you can talk about addiction and recovery and, and, you know, regretting things you said and done and then you getting a redemption and a chance to do it again if you're lucky and if you're willing. Um, all, all of this is part of my journey, man. And it really, it really segues really good with The Outsiders and, the, and what I felt and what I saw on that movie screen when I saw it um, 39 years ago as a 13-year-old uh, kid who saw basically the way I felt being portrayed for the first time on a screen in anywhere USA. I didn't know it was Tulsa when I first saw this. You know, it just looked like anywhere USA, and I knew it was a in a, you know an, an era that I didn't grow up in. But I kind of felt like our next generation was close to that. You know, I'm a Gen X to the baby boomer, and on the 39th anniversary, which is on the 25th, so a couple of days ago. It's just the, the theatrical release of The Outsiders celebrated 39 years. And I reached out to the guy who originally took me to see this film. And I said, Steve, can you believe it's 39 years, man? Oh, it, where does the time go? And I said, well, I hope wherever you are, you're doing well. Uh, miss you, man. Stay gold. And then I sent the message. And then I looked on his page just to see, like, where's he been? And I saw the rest in peace, Steve. Oh, Can't believe damn. you're gone. He overdosed. <sighs> Whether intentional or accidental uh this was a friend or a mentor to you well this was a guy i knew in junior high school who was 
the top athlete, probably the best looking dude in school. He was that good. He looked like a Marlon Brando type or Richard Grieco type, which is again, you're young, so these are names might not mean any. But there was Johnny Depp with the with the okay. with the Twenty One Jump Street, and then they did a like a a spin off show, and they had a better looking dude. There was Richard Grieco who looked like uh, Brando's. Marlon Brando's like you know son or something like that. Well, this guy looked like that. He was just smart, just all good American looking, guy. and all American. I mean, you couldn't you couldn't get a better you know. Uh, and coming out of that movie, he said, "What'd you think?" I said, "Oh, it was fantastic. I love it." He goes, "Yeah." I said, "You?" He goes, "Yeah, it was okay. I like the book better." I'm thinking. We're fucking 13, dude. Why are you reading? <laughs> Which now I know apparently a lot of 13s because all my customers, all of the fans that come by, they're all in seventh grade reading this and then devouring it. I wasn't one of those. I just didn't read like that. And I still don't read like that. I got a ninth grade education. Um, that being said, my heart goes out to the Sikorsky family and to Steve. And, you know, I tweeted it out. And then I also tweeted it out, you know, that, that he had passed and that he preferred the book to the movie. And now I understand why? Because I have since read the book a few times, and I understand that the, why but, the book is better. Are they very similar, or book is a little different? I'm the, going to read the book. I bought it, but okay, I just so have not yet. I don't want to mess it up for you, but it, it, it's common knowledge that anybody who's read the book and then sees the movie, especially in the 80s, were like, what's wrong? The movie is so different from the book. And the reason why the it, librarian who suggested that Coppola read the book and turn it into a movie and had a 100 of her students write letters to Coppola. He tried, but Warner Brothers didn't like the, what they were seeing, and they said, nope, we don't like it. It's like Gone with the Wind, edit accordingly. Matt Dillon is the clear breakaway star, and so edit this way. And they start to put Dallas Winston in almost every scene. They cut the court scene at the end. They cut the, the him walking home from the theater and the star. They cut a lot of pieces. So Coppola went back on the 35th anniversary and made the complete novel where he puts back those scenes. Oh, okay. So now it, it's linear to the to the to book. The but if you had read the book in seventh grade and then you saw the book, the movie when it came out around the same time, you're like, well, where's the rest of it? Like, it doesn't make sense that these scenes were deleted. But I only knew... The movie. the movie. So to me, it was flawless. I didn't know that, that, that there was a court case after. I didn't. I didn't even question the timeline or the, the well, storyline. It just was. So read both, and you'll see that the, the book is more. There's a lot more nuances and nooks and crannies. I don't even have the words to tell you sure. what the. You'll people prefer the book. Again, two different experiences for me because I read them at two different. I saw one when I was a you know a thirteen or fourteen year old, and then I read the book when I was like. 43 you know what i mean so well it's pretty rare too that the book and the film are the same i mean no matter what movie or book sure. is the case they're and usually the reason differences. that they wrote to coppola because i said why would you have 100 kids at, at seventh grade right to the guy who did the godfather and apocalypse now and she said danny great question we thought he did such a great job with the black stallion which was also a movie and a book that he stayed true to that that he would stay true to this but the the irony is that he only executive produced that movie he wasn't even the director of that so his hand wasn't even in that as far as the linear interesting to the book was but what i've realized is i thought i was making a, a museum for middle-aged greasers like myself what we see here every day is the family tree and it's usually propelled or powered by the seventh grader who just read the book and is on fire for it and there's the mom's like i remember reading it of course we'll take you honey calm down and they find the movie on online and they find it on Netflix or wherever they find it and they go oh my god this is a universe the fandom for this movie is still like it was it's bigger than it was yeah it just keeps growing and growing. it keeps growing and these kids now live in this these sub worlds of like it's acceptable to do that whatever that fan fiction and all of the little like you know when, when I was a kid we didn't do all that we were just like oh a cool movie that's it there was like the end now they get like deep dive there's and, blogs oh and, yeah, yeah there's yeah. just so much to chew on so like look at look what happened to Harry Potter. Oh, I know. I mean, I'm sure you guys have a small type so, version of that. Yeah. And so what I find is that every year there's a new crop of fans being minted in seventh grade and they want to see the they want to come to Ground Zero, which is this is the epicenter of all of the stuff. And we have the largest book collection known to man of the outsiders. I think it's been translated in over 33 languages. That being said, Susie just gave me, the author just gave me a book from Greece that we didn't, I didn't put it in there yet because there's no place to put it in the cabinet. But it just keeps growing. We have Chinese versions, we have Russian versions, places where they're, you, they would outlaw those kind of, their, their, their books exist. Japanese, Italy, Germany. We, so the, the, 
the story is timeless and it's an American classic and um, it's just going to keep going. So this is just like one of those things. It's a once in a lifetime book and movie and uh, it's driven by the book but the movie doesn't hurt. <laughs> sure. You know, the kids find that as well. And then the stars that came out of that, they're still stars. And there's most, for the most part, they're still, they're all actively working or doing something and uh, some bigger than others. And, but that's such as life. And, uh, it's been a fantastic part to be a, a part of this man. And I, I think, um, you know, uh, people use a hundred years ago, people would leave the Midwest to go, go West and reinvent themselves. I did the opposite. You know, I came to the Midwest and 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 found the love and the support and the 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 the, the connection that I was looking for for most of my life. And it's centered through the the story of the outsiders and and buying the house was you know uh, was was the you know the the connective tissue to the community. But uh, then I'm home. You know, I, I I've been here five years. I have. I never go, man. I shouldn't have left LA. Or damn, I wonder if I. What would I be doing? I never even think of it. My phone rings this way, meaning like people call me to go. You still loving? I'm like, yeah, I still loving, bro. And they're like, what's going on out there? Every time I turn around, you're in the newspaper or the thing. I'm like, look, it, yeah, it's the outsiders. That's the the you know the driving force. But come here, and you'll see. And every time my friends come, they go, I get it. Well, yeah, you're bringing you're bringing guys from New York. Never even been here. To I move know, out. but even it would, it's 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 one thing if if I only got it and it doesn't apply to them, they get here and they understand. And it's you guys that make it. You guys are all you you, you know friendly and hospitable and and the gas prices the seven dollars in la six something in la here it's three something it's like always half houses that would cost you a million dollars in la are two hundred fifty thousand dollars here yeah we don't have the beaches we don't have but i can fly to la anytime i want i can drive from i'm dead center of the u.s i i love to road trip so i'm in striking distance of you can't find a better place to, if you're a road trip guy, to to hang your hat than in Tulsa, Oklahoma. You are literally you're like 40 miles from the actual center. Like there is a town I forget what it's called that it's like 40 miles from here. Fuck it, what is 40 miles to a? You, you yeah. know what I mean? Tulsa is close enough to being dead center of the U.S. And like, there's no traffic really. No traffic. The airport it looks like something out of the 50s in Mad Men. You there's like <laughs> there's I have all that TSA pre-check and that that whatever. It's two you or three don't even minutes. Need it. You don't even need it. One time I needed it because there was like a volleyball team. Yeah. <laughs> and they all had their shit like they didn't like, it was like their first time they ever flown. So they didn't have all their stuff. I was like, oh my God, it's early. Going through going through TSA in Tulsa, you can typically wait, you wait longer usually at Starbucks than yeah. you do through getting no, 100%. to your and, and, and Yeah, 100%. There's a bagel shop with coffee and the, the line's longer to get through that than it is to, to the TSA here. So for a guy who's 53 years old, who's still super young. I still look like I and feel like I did when I was a kid. Just mentally, I've grown. And, and you know, little aches and pains here and there. What I'm trying to say is that maybe in my 20s, this would have been a little slow, slower than what I was used to because we were in Hollywood. We were running crazy. Everybody around us was famous. Everybody had money. Everybody, we went from like poppers to like that. And even when we were, before House of Pain hit, we were still running with all those kids because we were street kids that were in hip hop. And they were like, we found our our little gang in, 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 in Hollywood and we just ran. There's always something to do. I feel like you slept like an average of three hours a night for like 10 years. That's, that's all, what I portray. 20 something years, of course. And I mean, if you haven't seen Kid 90, see that documentary that Soleil Moonfry, who was Punky Brewster, and she was a child star. And then she used to run with us, which is like, how weird was that? Like you got an eighties child star who was five foot five and she's running out house of pain and Cypress Hill and all of these other stars from the future big stars like Leo and some, you have to see it. And it's about the nineties in LA. She started off to do a documentary about the last generation with, with that knew what it's like to grow up without cell phones and social media and pictures of everything. It's called kid 90 kid 90. Yeah. Netflix and it just or? came out. No, on Hulu. Okay. And uh, you'll see it, and you'll, you'll see my segment on there, too, and you're like, whoa. And uh, a lot of people didn't make it through that thing, man, which is also. But she got, if you want to see a, a bird's eye view of what Hollywood looked like in the early to mid-90s and how crazy it was and how cool it was, that's it. This is when the Viper Room first opened. This is when the stars still lived in Hollywood. This is, nobody lives in Hollywood anymore. There's nobody, like, <laughs> Hollywood is like a, 
a brand like a pastime now yeah but it's not even in, and for years it has been like you you're not finding people you know you, you'll you'll find some people who still live in beverly hills and i'm sure Sly Stallone still has a mansion in beverly hills or wherever and most of the real rich stars are in malibu or they're not in the state if that makes sense they're in sonoma county or they're out on wyoming ranch or you don't have to live in la to do this anymore to, to act you don't have to be you, in the yeah, yeah you can do your thing on zoom or you can show up for the the the, the audition of, at, at an appointment and then be if you got it like that but there's no it, the early 90s was the last time that you could still run into everybody madonna mickey rourke fucking Hell's Angels over there, this one over there, this at Lowriders there. It was just like everybody was out and on point and doing their thing. That's all done. It's, it's all tourists and like transient people who were trying to find their, you know, fame and fortune. But it's just, it's celebrity. People filming TikToks in the of, street. Yeah, that's, it's just the world's changed. It's the world's changed. And Hollywood is not what it used to be. And so be it. You know, I had the, I feel like I had the best, you know, ride that I could possibly have there, good, bad, or indifferent. And uh, I'm glad I went through all that because it makes me completely grat uh, grateful for being here in the time that I'm here while Tulsa is rediscovering um, you know, re reinventing itself and rediscovering its former greatness. And uh, it comes from being, um, you know, helpful and, uh, and, and the communal spirit that's here. I don't see that. I've never seen that in LA. I've never seen like neighbors helping neighbors. And I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I'm just saying I never seen it. Uh, you, again, come here. You want to do your podcast. You probably find, you know, all kinds of support for it. Find a radio station. will help you do it, but whatever. I, 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 I sound like a broken record to most people who've heard me talk about it because it, when you find something that's true and you and it resonates with the people, I just feel like this was like, I didn't know that this kind of thing still existed where like you could go somewhere you thought that it was something wasn't Hollywood or LA. Time. I thought it was over. Once Hollywood was over or New York, like when those things, they changed. They got gentrified. They got like places that used to be seedy and cool are now million dollar hotels and it cost you $600 a night to stay in places that used to be like greasy little like after hour clubs like and like, yeah, like had some like, you know, some, some greasy shit. Those were make, that's what made New York and LA great. That there were like good parts of town, bad parts of town, late night parts of town, this part for the breakfast, go over here. It was like, those are all gone. It feels very like commercialized Vegas to me, like New York, New York, you know, and it's all tour buses of tourists and million dollar high rises that you'll never be able to afford to live in and nothing nothing native to new york anymore it's like all not real made authentic in china, or genuine. made in china and built up for super rich people that are i, I don't know I, I i digress but the the the, the truth is man this is like an all-american um kick-ass city that has a little bit of everything uh and i'm just happy to be here man it really is like life changing for me and I didn't think it existed. So I'm happy. And if you feel like I do and you just want, you want a fighting chance to just get your idea to pop or find somewhere that you could restart over, there's nothing better in my book than the Midwest, but in particular Tulsa. So that's cool, man. It'll be, I think it'll be unique for people who are from Oklahoma, like myself to hear you talk so highly of it yeah. and how it changes your life. It's, Cause you guys try to go out and figure out if it's going to work somewhere else for you. And then you'll end up coming back on, you know what? It wasn't so bad until so or Oklahoma. I hear that a lot. It's a rite of passage. It happens everywhere. Yeah. It's what I grew up in the San Fernando Valley. It's one hill over from Hollywood. It's a, 15 minute drive if there's no traffic or 10 minutes if there's no traffic it's traffic take you an hour my point is it was like the promised land was hollywood you know but again i don't see that anymore maybe these tiktokers see it but it's not i don't see it used to be you could go over there and have a fighting chance whether you rap sing dance poetry whatever your thing was if you were creative there was an outlet for you and you had a good chance if you honed your skill at the comedy store or the this thing or the growlings or the that you could, you, you next thing you could be the biggest thing on TV or the biggest band in the world or the, and I just, I don't know, but I'm happy where I'm at and I, I hope more people, uh, when they come through, they see it. I don't even have to sell it. I don't have to tell nobody shit. I just put them in my car, I take them around, they go, I get it now, you know, and uh, that's it. I that's get awesome. It too. Yeah, man. Well, congrats on being an adopted Okie. That's uh, it. I appreciate you coming on the podcast, man. No, nah, and I appreciate uh, you bringing it to me. It made it very easy, man. Yeah, you know, dude. I feel, you know, nowhere better for me to do it than in the outsider's house. It's still weird to be here to do things that aren't like 
specific to the outsiders, but that's the great thing about it, man. We use this as all kinds of things. So it's a, it's a, it's almost like a civic center to me. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I hope this is better than, uh, this is why I like podcasting so much. It's not scripted. It's not the news. You know, there's no lights and cameras. It's one-on-one. -on -one. You talking about sobriety, you talking about growing up rough and yeah, man. why this inspired you. But, um, go ahead and tell, talk about the, um, uh, the, the extras on the lawn yeah the extras on the lawn if you want to, all the information i don't want to mess it up but if you go on our facebook page the outsiders house museum all the information is there we're going to go half and half and give out tickets for that event april Just, 23rd yeah i think it's april 23rd you got it up on your screen or no i don't know but i'll tell you what i don't because i don't want to mess it up and everybody knows how to go online you could find it it is, I believe, April twenty third, and what we do is we we get a blow up screen and we do a, we do we show the movie on the lawn. But this time, my employees and my volunteers decided that it would be cool to bring all the extras that they could find that had appeared in the movie back to Tulsa. Some live in Tulsa, some live in the state, but not in Tulsa, and some were flying in. So we're going to get the largest amount of people that had appeared in this movie to come back to this movie and do a Q and A uh, before the film. And then we'll show the film and then we'll all hang out and eat, drink and be merry at the outsider's house. And uh, is it the 23rd? Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, 23rd gates at six movie at eight fifteen. And... Movies at dawn. Usually whenever you, we can never tell when sure. it's dusk, I mean, dawn. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now I go, nothing goal can stay. Um, the flyers dope by the way, the old school flyer. Yeah. Cool. The, That's the my greaser. boy, Donnie Rich's buddy who did all those flyers, but uh, it's just a cool event, man. This is a family event, but there's, you know, to meet all the people that were involved in this movie, um, it, it, it changed everybody's life, man. I mean, it's like the thing that they're the most proud of or one of the things that they're most proud of. And I love hearing the stories over and over. Some I've heard, uh, you know, a thousand times. They just never, I never get tired of hearing what, when they met Patrick and they were on the scene with that, and then Patrick did this, and then, you know, Matt said something there. And they, you know, just, yeah, they, it's, it's one after the other, and it's incredible. And if you love The Outsiders and you live close enough to come to be at this event or you want to even fly in to see it, it's, it's a unique thing. And we're getting to that age where this, you know, every year we're losing people and every year we're losing things. And, you know, this is a, I don't want to say a once in a lifetime chance, but you never know, you know. Um, if you love The Outsiders like we love The Outsiders, it's you should come. And, and we're going to give away two tickets. I'm going to give Correct. you one and you're going to buy one. And that's going to, we'll meet in the middle. And, uh, yeah, it, come check it out. It's going to be cool. The, the I'm excited because I haven't met some of the people that they're bringing into town. I've met most of them. And we have a wall in here that everybody signed. Originally, it was just going to be S.C. Hinton who was going to sign the house. Now it's and littered then, with all of them. And then Darren Dalton came. And so I was like, all right, Darren and Tommy, you guys can sign. That's it, though. <laughs> and then Rob Lowe came when I wasn't here. And they're like, Rob signed. And I'm like, yeah, of course. So Rob sure. signed. And then people who were like, the next guy who signed was a guy... Uh, who I met, who was a, a local kid here, who was in the the scene at the drive-in, and uh, man, he's gonna kill me. It's my big Viking homeboy, the red-haired, bearded Viking, who, whose name I, I'm telling you, man, these migraines. Even though my headache is gone, uh, I'm all like, uh, I can't grasp the name, but he signed next and he was like man i ain't signing that wall dude that's for stars and i'm like you're a star in that universe you're in the outsiders you're signing the motherfucking wall and he signed the wall and next thing you know we've got i think like 80 signatures on there anybody who's taking any part you're gonna look up the name yeah because we've been to is it jesse plemons no oh that's the guy no so jesse plemons that's yes. what we were talking about earlier right yeah that's the star of of all those movies no this guy was the little he was a neighborhood kid Mitt Marshall, Br uh, Bryce Marshall, uh, Google Bryce Marshall. It would be okay. on my thing, not yours. Anyway, if you remember the concession scene where a kid goes backwards through the line, is cutting a line, and he starts a fight between the two older, Greaser and Soch, that kid was a neighborhood kid who Coppola took a liking to, and then he put him in the drive-in movie scene. And he was also one of the first extras that I had met before meeting most of the stars. And we, we insisted that he come to one of our benefits. He drove all the way from Texas to be here. And when the stars signed the wall, I said, hey, Bryce, you're next, buddy. And he's like, no, 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 don't do that to me. I said, you're, you're signing. And he's my size, and he's like, nah, bro, I don't feel comfortable because that, that's for, I'm like, you are fucking in this universe, a star to me. You were in that movie. You're signing. He signed, and we were both a little emotional about it. Nice. But it broke the ice, and then after that, 
everybody, if you were, I don't care if you work lighting, you were a cop on the film, you were, whatever the deal is, if you were in the movie and you feel like sign the wall. So we have, we have, I'm, I haven't counted, but There's today there was another person that signed yesterday. There were two people from the movie that signed the girl with the ponytail in the fire scene at the church. Mm -hmm. She signed. And another guy who was a greaser, an extra, he passed by at the driving scene. He came, dropped off photos. They both gave me home photos, and they both signed the wall. Um, a day before that, Matt Dillon signed the wall. You know what I mean? It's just like, you just anybody that comes through is legitimate me in this. We want them on there because it's going to be there forever. The guy who's uh, was an extra here, the tour guide. Yeah, uh, Joey Clem. He's a then, he's a phenomenal guide, by the way. Fantastic. These everybody who works here or volunteers here, he volunteers here, so he doesn't get he he does this for for just for fun, fun. for free. You uh, can tell he loves it when when I came. And they all do, man. Listen, the. There's part of me that's like, I wish I had that kind of money to give everybody a paycheck, but half the people won't take the money. I try to give them a little, you know, and they're like, brother, 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 stop, stop. You're embarrassing me. I'm like, no, nah, I need you to, and you know, uh, it's, it's tough. But uh, yeah, they, we have a few people that were in the movie. The, Joe Cervantes, he sells his photos that he took on the set, but he was also a greaser at the at the Pines when the fight breaks out. You see him yeah, for him. a second. Yeah, he did oh, my tour, and he's awesome. Yeah, he's great. So there's just like so many. Oh, you got Joey, though, because the, the, the other guy sells his photos. Or he's, did you, the photo guy did your tour? Uh, Yeah. Okay. Well, they, I think they were both here. But, yeah, they're both here, yeah. But yeah, he, yeah. he walked me around and just kept telling me detail after detail yeah. after detail. And it wasn't, it they was. I love this. It was good, yeah. And I love them for it, man. I, I'm a lucky guy, and, and, and you know what? These are the things, man, and I, I don't say this like, you know, I knock on wood for real, for real, because it could be me. Like I said, if I died after that photo with Matt Dillon and, and Susie Hinton, I, I felt like, okay, well, shit, there, I've done 99.9% .9 of the stuff I set out to do. I wouldn't be at the gates of wherever going, oh, you needed more. Like, I, don't, I, I hope to be here till you know, at least my late 70s. But my point is, is that we're all aging and we're all getting to that point. And Joe in the kitchen is 78 years old. He caught COVID twice. It was bad. We oh, were wow. worried about him. Um, and, you know, it could happen to the youngest person who's here. You know, it could do, anything could happen. Today, unfortunately, um, if you know the movie, you know that in Sperry, Oklahoma, the DX station is there and somebody, uh, a man named Gary has restored it and he's turning it into like an attraction as well. And then there's the 52 card pickup scene that happens in the back of a Rexall. Well, the store next to a Rexall, it's like a hundred year old uh, building. Somebody stole a car and was running from the cops and didn't know at the end of this block, like he didn't have time to hit the brakes. And he hit this building and literally killed himself in the crash. And the car caught on fire, caught the building on fire, and then the roof collapsed upon itself. So this was today, recently? This is this last night at midnight. Oh, wow. And I got there today after my meeting at about 11, and the fire was still going. Damn. And the building was, yeah. So my point is, is life is fragile and life is temporary and everything will soon, you know, Nothing gold can stay, right? Um, so I always tell people, if you get the chance, do it now. Don't wait. And it's not 100%. me selling you tickets. We always sell out. I give away a handful of tickets just to make sure people get to experience it. But if you like this like I like it, Joe ain't going to be around. Danny ain't going to be around all the time. Like you, 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 all of us are going to, you know, eventually one day he's just going to, oh, he's no longer here. So we still have a large group of people who are involved with this movie. Come meet them now. Come talk to them now. If you have any inclination to, like, pick their brains or shake their hand or just to take a photo with them or just to be in the midst of a bunch of people who were here in 82 when Coppola came to town with this bunch of basically unknown actors who turned out to be some of the biggest actors in Hollywood and to, to take this book to the next level, it's you're here at the epicenter of it. And uh, again, I'm actually glad to offer this to people. And this came organically from the staff. I didn't even come up with this event. They thought it would be a good idea. And I think it's a brilliant idea. And that's why I kind of didn't know the date or I don't know the, because I just was like, let me see how they do it. And they've been doing it perfectly. They didn't even need me to do anything, which is, uh, it lets me know that it's, this also is not dependent on me. This yeah. thing's going to keep going when I'm gone. When you're gone, and yeah. And that it's makes gonna... me feel good even though I'm here. <laughs> and I'm only 53. I ain't going nowhere, hopefully. <laughs> but it makes me feel good that they, I look at everything that they've done, and they've done it with, with the way I would have done it in better. So I don't, I don't lose sleep over, like, who's going to handle this when I'm not around? They're already doing it when I'm not around. I try not to come here all the time because it gets a little weird for me too, you know, awkward-wise and people-wise. And I'm an extrovert and an introvert. 
and struggle in between both of those. Sometimes yeah, when, I'm when, out there and wilding, and other times I'm like, just stop telling people that there he goes, there's the guy. That, yeah, I get mad at sometimes my employees will be like, here he is, and I'm like, don't do that to me, man. You throw me under the bus right now. I got a fucking headache. I'm trying to get my, <laughs> you know, I'm trying to get the mail and go home. Yeah, you yeah. Know, I got the dog in the car. Don't do that to me. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm like, bro, you know? Yeah, when I, because I came by, I did the tour about a month ago and I talked to Mary and I, yeah. I just try to, you know, if I want to get you on the, on the podcast, sure, yeah. I, can, I can hit your DMs and you may see it, you may not, but I, I was like, I know you're not here all the time, but I said, I want to come by and try to introduce myself. And then I said, hey, you don't have to, um, you don't have to say anything, but if you want, I would like if yeah, let no, him no, know if he's of interested. Course. So. Yeah, no, fantastic. And they always, like I said, I got pictures today. Somebody signed the wall. They brought by some um, some magazines and some clippings. They sent me, hey, somebody came by. I always get the message, but again, I, I, I find comfort in knowing that I can look in the security cameras from wherever I am in the world and go thumbs up. Everything's going the way it's supposed to be. It's not contingent on me being here because that would also be a hindrance because I have other aspirations, and I'm also doing other outsider stuff. I mean, the dream is the to make Airbnb. an SE, that too, and then we're done with that, and now that's going. But my dream is to really, as as, as time goes on, I start to realize, man, I, I'm such a fan of, of SE Hinton's, and not only the outsiders. Now I have this uh, completely new found appreciation and love for Rumblefish and Tex, and that was then, this is now, and what she's done and what she means to seventh graders who are reading her, there needs to be a bigger museum. This is this house is a collector's item. You know, it was in the movie. It is like a, a it is one of the things that is like you know, but this is an antiquated small house. I need a place that we can build from scratch that has modern technology that kids that know how to use because these kids are like two with the ipads bigger than that like you know, television they little ipad yeah and headphones and to see stuff in hologram and in the, in the metaverse and uh, you rumble in the metaverse and listen to coppola talk about the per whatever just there's so many possibilities and it's all centered around this little 15 and a half year old girl who started to write her story, The Outsiders this at is, Rogers High School, failing English with a D plus in creative writing that year. I did remember uh, you saying that. I mean, dude, you, you, can't, you can't script this. You couldn't write that better. If you wrote that, you'd be like, if I wrote that as a screenplay, people are like, come on, man. She's 15 and a half and she's failing English with D plus and she writes a novel that goes on to sell for the next 55 years, never out of print. I mean, nobody's buying that, dude. And I'd be like, I don't know. But it's true, and that's what makes her like this story powerful to me. Because she wasn't like straight A student, you know, Mensa student, card holder, you know, whatever. She just was like a regular girl, dude. Just had and a good told, imagination, and yeah, she put her pen to paper, and she said that she didn't let her punctuation or lack thereof or spelling get in her way. I let a lot of things get in my way because I thought if it wasn't perfect, why do it? And I'm a perfectionist who then loves to procrastinate. It's like analysis paralysis. Oh, if it doesn't, and a lot of people suffer from that. They don't get nothing done. She just got it done, and she kept on going. Yeah, so, so if, you, if yeah. you wait for the perfect time, you'll never oh, get started. Oh, never! It's never the perfect time. I buy shit and keep it on ice so that when the when my life is all perfect, then I'll break these kicks out and these sheets out and these towels. I'm like, what the, f dude? I might be dead by that time. Like, you just I life is right in his now, now. I always now, said that with know? my with my wife because we we talked. My son's 14 months old. We talked about having him, and I said I always I always had these things in my mind that I wanted before I had a kid. So much money in the bank and of been course. somewhere for working somewhere, and then, you know, Lindsay finally was just like. It's never going to be the perfect time. Never. No, it, no matter how you do it, even if it feels that for the moment, your mind will immediately go, you know what, but where I need the... the, 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 the I probably would have been 45 before I, I figured that. Just do there, it. So. I mean, you just got to do what you got to do. And right now is the only thing that we have. Yesterday's history and tomorrow's a mystery. And that's, a, you know, that's another part of recovery, man, is just living in the now. A lot of the, the pain that I experience is because I'm thinking about shit that happened in the past and I'm re going through it and it's pain is, nothing's happening right now to me that is painful. It's me chopping up the old memories or future tripping you know, I, with this economy and the, the way that things are going, I won't be able to have the thing. And I start to get in pain thinking of the things that I can't achieve because of external forces like the president or the this or the... Dude, if I stay in the now, we have everything we need. We're yeah. here at the outside of us. We're doing a podcast. We're well, well fed. I'm eating licorice. You got a nice watch on. You got. We, what do we need? I mean, we have more than we need. We're in abundance of everything we need right now. Um, the pain only comes from the, either one of those, you know, future and past for the most part. 
Um, and I try to stay in this now. And uh, yeah, um, life is good, man. I, I, I think we'll end with that. I don't know how much more no, I can good. add without, you know, yeah. it's not that I'm tired. I could go another two hours with you, bro. I just don't want to keep, you know, no, I don't want good. people to be like, you know, I I guess if I can end, you know, with with anything, it's that, you know, when I hear myself now, I don't know who I am compared to the guy I was back then. And some of the stuff I say now sounds hokey to me and bullshit and sounds like, come on, bro. Or, all right, we get it, but enough. But if you go through what I go through, it's like it took me everything to be here. I had to go through a lot to be here right now. And everybody has that in some way or another, you know? And I, I just didn't know any of that was possible. I found, uh, you know, hope and, and, and come from a, a, a point of view of gratitude, like I said. And that's from a recovered alcoholic and drug addict who now is, you said CEO, I don't consider myself a CEO, but you know, I own this house, I own the house across the street. I have a small staff. I have, and this is, I promise you, it's not me bragging. I'm just saying this probably the first time ever. And I don't even count it as like my things. But the stuff that, stuff is achievable when I, when I stop killing myself one day at a time. And the stuff that comes out of it is, is beneficial to everybody, man, including myself. And, uh, you know, that is the true, like when I, when I think of, you know, how it relates to all of this is that like, I, I would love to know what like the characters went on to like it, we know Dally died and Johnny unfortunately died saving a girl which is a redemption for the the protecting his friend and unfortunately had a kill but I think like there's part of me that that was that little greaser at one point who should have been dead a long time ago but I actually kept going despite everything that I created bad in my life or the, the bad shit life threw at me you know and 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 the fortitude to just keep going, it, it shows here for me. And this is like, um, I don't know if this ain't even making any sense, but like, I feel like yeah, this is like the perfect, you know, happy ending for me, you know? Like I'm in this like world of all of this, like, you know, greaser, all American, center of the the, the, the US, like it's all perfect. It, it, and, and I couldn't have scripted my life any better and I guess it just feels good to really enjoy where you're at. And I really enjoy where I'm at. And I thank you for doing that and for allowing me to talk to people about that. And for all of the fans that love The Outsiders and by de facto showing up here, it shows up, you know, you're showing up for, for me and my business and what we do. And it just is like this really great life that I didn't know was possible in a place that I didn't know existed up until about a decade ago. And people I had never met until a couple of years ago are like family to me. It's like the family we choose. And I, and, and I heard someone say that, you know, today, the family of choice. It's so good to be around the family of choice. And uh, I choose all the people in my life today or God or the universe throws in my way and, I, and I'm just happy to be where I'm at. And that feels really good to say that. It was, there was a long time I couldn't say that. And so again, I owe it to Tulsa, I owe it to SC Hinton, I owe it to the Outsiders fans. And I feel like I've earned my seat here and my, and my place here uh, by doing what we've done to, you know, to celebrate those legacies. And so, yeah, change is possible and, and recovery is possible. And, uh, I feel like I'm living testimony to that, man. If there's anything that anybody takes away from that is that, you know, those things are possible and I didn't see a way out. Well, kind of, kind of like you back. mentioned for, for you guys' hit, uh, jump around, you couldn't fake, you can't fake your feelings right now. They're very yeah. genuine and authentic and, uh, you can truly tell that you've, you found your home and you're, you're thriving and it's awesome. I'm glad you've uh, you've made it made it here and been so successful, and everyone's been supportive of you too. No so. doubt, no doubt. Well, before I forget, and I don't know how uh, practical it is, or even if you have an interest in it, but I'm thinking out loud, it might be cool to do like a, a podcast with the, with some of the extras that night too, to pod podcast from meet people and sit them down and get a couple minutes of their how they ended up here it might be a cool little episode you yeah know, we could do to it do that yeah i'm just yeah we could we let's 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 let's, let's keep in touch and maybe yeah, work it out yeah, yeah yeah let me talk to the to people who set it all up that, that does yeah, stuff yeah. on their toes but i think it'd be great because i want to document their stories and i want to hear you know we'll look back and, and in a certain amount of time we're like man remember when we did that and we got these people on tape and 
It'd be cool, man. No, let's see if we can't plan something. That'll Come be on. a busy day, but maybe we can figure it but out. But it's really mellow before, so that's the good part. You True. Know, you'd be able to pull people aside. But I appreciate you, man. Yeah, you too, brother. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, I want to close it out with this. So uh, my wife actually started going back to school uh, for she wants to be a, a substance abuse counselor. Yeah. So if you would give my wife, Lindsay, a shout out and say, uh, she was super hesitant to start maybe because she, yeah. she, you know, go back to school when she was uh, 30 and didn't, didn't want, you know, kind of start over career wise. Right, right, so right. yeah, no, I cool mean, if you Lindsay, give her a shout out. I'm but. just, you know, Lindsay, I'll give you a shout out. Your heart's in the right uh, place. It is a very challenging field, but it, the, the rewards are, are, are many. And uh, I found by, giving of myself freely that I've received way more than I've ever given, which is the weird paradox of all that, you know, uh, you give and, 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 and it returns and, uh, it's, it's much needed. And especially in this, these trying times, man, there's a lot of people, uh, that could use that help. And, uh, that's what I find myself doing. I just stay in the solutions and I stay of service. Yeah. Uh, you know, she- unity service and recovery is where, where, where where it's at for me you know yeah. she's going back to school like i said you know we just had our son and 30 and a lot of people are kind of already established so she was kind of kind of gun shy just because it's uh intimidating and indifferent but she did sure. it and i'm happy for her and she's super smart and good on her i appreciate the shout out yeah no doubt well thanks brother i appreciate it stay going